All right. All right. We're comfortable. We got stuff going on. <laughs> Welcome uh, to my show. Oh, yeah? <laughs> I'm glad you're all okay. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, uh, welcome to another episode of To the Full is with Jason Froberg. Today, my good friend, Michael Mesonet on the podcast. Mr. Stoner Dude. Thank you for having me today. <laughs> I woke up, got here on time, and I'm all bong hit it up and ready to go. <laughs> Yeah, I'm feeling pretty good myself, brother. Feeling pretty good myself. You know, hey, this is pretty cool, uh, uh -huh. Jason. Ever since the pandemic started, yeah, uh, you've managed to uh, use some of your many great talents and your great knowledge. Uh, you're a great technician. You're a sound guy. You're, and to to put it all together like this, so you can get your uh, your local musicians here in Vegas, or just people people in general that you want to have to, together to kick back and talk. I mean, people are just sitting on the internet, anyways, right? Yeah. So let's get them all going. Do you even have, do you have a chat room, or are you gonna do that later? Uh, there's actually like a, there's a chat on the YouTube channel, but nobody ever uses oh, it. Oh, that's, that's like stupid. Yeah. We need to make that happen next time. Yeah, man. Um, yeah, I don't know what to, I'll figure that out. Yeah, that yeah. sounds like fun. Like it's, I just said you were a smart guy, so yeah. I figure it figure out eventually. Of course. Maybe I could just loop, um, where am I at? I can just loop all my uh, podcasts because now I have like, this, be, this is the 25th episode. Am I so number 25? Number 25. I'm 25. <laughs> the the friggin' uh, the landmark, man. We made it. I yes. don't know how the, we've done 25 of these. But that's like uh, close to 48 hours of uh, probably over 48 hours now of bullshit and chat. Of just bullshit. <laughs> yeah. I'm pretty sure I could get one of those live streams and just hook up a server and live stream the whole playlist on repeat. You know, for like two days and well, just put twenty four seven, and that you can put a that you can put a chat. Maybe on the side. by show fifty, you'll figure that out. Maybe by show thirty, I'll <laughs> wow. figure that out. Wow, maybe you really the, set your sights high. Maybe the, by the time I air this sucker right here, I'll <laughs> yeah, have it figured right out. I bet I can get a live stream good. page up and going by tonight. Shit. So uh, yeah, no, that's a good idea actually. I like that. I like that. We were looking into doing some of that for some uh, some chiller music and and like hang it, hang out stuff. We've been we've been all into the YouTube ideas, man. See, so. I suck at all that stuff. I know how to hit things. <laughs> As you can see, I know how to splatter paint on a piece of paper. Beautifully, by the uh, way. Thank you very much. And, uh, you know, I brought some of my, my artwork today to share with some some folks. We and got some back there, too. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> but anyways, yeah, some people just have what I call an aptitude for technology, and I don't. Yeah. I, gotta, I, I have to make friends like you. So that I can make things happen. Otherwise, it, it all just sits in the garage and just kind of I look at it by myself. So I'm really oh. thankful for my internet people, my technicians, you know, the guys that can press the buttons and remember how to follow instructions. I couldn't even do that when I was a kid with the uh, models, you know, the snap together models. Yeah. I couldn't even do those. Really? Yeah. Directions, they say step one and then step two, I'm done. I can't figure out nothing. Oh, man. Yeah. No, I'm all into that stuff. I used to love putting models together. You, I mean, you seem to be that kind of dude. I can't help myself with the electronics and the gear and stuff. Like the audio thing, that shit just, that gets me off, man. I'm into that so much that I am just driven to go do it. And, uh, I mean, I did it for, I did it for nothing when I was in my 20s, you know, just so I could mix the bands. I didn't care. I'm like that Free with, drinks uh, and let's do this. I'm like that with drawing and cartooning and, and things like that, paintbrush. It's pretty much, it's like, that's how I... I just kind of get in my own little universe, you know, and just and just lose myself and kind of let it happen. It's like a superpower, <laughs> you know? Oh, yeah. I think we all got superpowers. It's just a matter of just pretty much tapping into them, finding out what it is, and uh, just allowing it to happen, giving it the time. Yeah, man. What do they say? If you, if you do something 10,000 hours, you become a master? That's the idea, yeah, right? Yeah, just, just look at, just put, just put 10,000 hours aside <laughs> and just go for it. <laughs> Hell yeah, that's, re that's really what it, it boils down to. I mean, uh, I can't tell you how many hours I've played on a, on a bass, but it doesn't matter how much time I take off. I come back to it. That's I can play that thing. Have so, you been yeah. playing your bass? No, I've been playing um, acoustic guitar. Honestly, I've been huh? jamming some chords. Some different. Some different, man. I, there's no shows to play, so like that'll be there. Right. And I'll come right. back and I'll freshen up. You've already mastered it. Yeah, you it's one do of those things. Different. It's ten thousand hours. That's what I was trying to say. It's ten thousand hours, right? right like right. I mean, I've been doing it since I was a kid, and uh, and so yeah, I can definitely jump back on it. But acoustic guitar, 
nowhere near 10,000 hours. <laughs> I suck at acoustic guitar, right? So I'm pushing that 10,000 hours You're now. like at 10 hours? Right? No, <laughs> definitely not at 10 hours. Oh, definitely not at 10. But uh, yeah, no, that's that's where it's at. But I'm I'm also starting to do a little bit of art. So, yeah, but yeah, but I'm not an artist like you, man. Look at this beautiful stuff. No, wait a me. minute. When you, I hear this a lot. Yeah. I'm not an artist like you. Yeah, it's a nice compliment. I'll take it and I'll accept it, and I and I appreciate uh, anybody liking my art. But when it comes to people and being an artist, being an artist is just that's you. You are the artist. Yeah, there's not like a gauge. Unless you're trying to get a job or trying to earn money and you're competitive, mm -hmm. you're an artist, you basically create, you express, yeah. whether it's uh, painting, drawing, music, spoken word, whatever your thing is, you know, you know what art is. Um, but basically, ultimately, I think uh, a lot of artists have a little bit of a, what's the word I'm looking for? <sighs> They're just kind of scared of what people think. Yeah. A complex. Yeah. There's a complex. Uh, oh, big time. There's an intimidation that's involved. And, and, and I think it's pretty much just like I said, you really just got to let yourself go and not gauge yourself or compare yourself to anybody else. And I yeah. really, I love to, like, for example, I get a lot of uh, little kids. Like when I'm, I'm an artist uh, and I do a lot of comic book conventions and I've been teaching art uh, for a lot of years as well. So I know a lot of artists of all different ages. It's just the coolest thing. And it really doesn't matter if it's a little kid or, or uh, an adult or even someone that's just starting. If you, sh if you actually put that time into something and created something out of nothing and it all came from that time you put into it and immersed yourself and didn't care about any of that, and you had something to show for it, whether you think it's gray or whatever, it's something and it's art. It's, it's a, you've lived and breathed into it yeah. and it exists. And then you have something to look at for yourself as far as an accomplishment. You feel good. Oh, I, I actually did something. And then you do another one and another one and another one and just keep going. So uh, I do like to hear when like, say you started painting. Cause I knew, I know a lot of people that paint and draw. Yeah. Some are just, you know, amateurs, I guess, in the sense that they, you know, they're just doing it for fun at home. Um, some are, are professionals, but all those people that, that put that time into it, it's, it's art. And it's a good thing. It is good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that's where I'm at right now. Like, uh, it, it's one of those things where art is your ability to translate what you see in your head through your appendages onto your appendages. Yeah, right. Like your fingers oh, okay, or your, your hands right. or like whatever people want to do their art with. Some people do their art all kinds of weird ways, right? Uh, so, however, you're coming out, you're trying to take something inside of your head. And putting it out there for the world to see as well to show everybody what's well, in your head, right? Well, we look forward to seeing your portfolio on the internet here, right? Pretty soon. I've only done a couple of little things, but I, I see. I go with what you were saying, right? Where it was, um, I know that I'm not trained, and I'm not like this isn't going to come out like a masterpiece, right? So I go into it with that mentality of just make it, make it messy, then. make it, yeah, just, just make it, just make it, <laughs> just just give your best shot. You know it's not going to be some Van Gogh, but who gives a shit, right? And just do it, and then like it's it's something you did, and if you if you're if it's something that is driving you, you'll get better. I have I have a little story to tell. I would love to. So we're talking about art and uh, the uh, whole idea, uh, the mindset of being intimidated or just like feeling you did not uh, do your best or it wasn't good enough. Um, I'm because I've been drawing my whole life. Uh, I've, you know, I, I guess I could say, yes, I'm an artist and I've been doing this uh, a lot of years and I got pretty good at it. And then, uh, by the time I started getting into high school, that's usually when your friends and your peers are now starting to kind of notice what you do and you're making friends, you know, and th and, and, and an art class and just in general, because you can draw or you can do this or you can play a music, an instrument or whatever, but they start to notice. And it, I think as a young person, you got to get a little full of yourself. I know I have. For sure. I, I, I became a little full of myself. I knew I was one of the best artists in school. I was winning contests and all kinds of things. That ego will drive you. Mom, I got, I got, I may only be about five, five and a half of my ego is at least 10 feet tall. <laughs> you know, I, my ego is way bigger than I'll ever be. Yeah. Um, so anyway, and especially as a young person. Uh, so anyway, so I'm like in high school, fifth, uh, when you're in 13, 14 years old, 12, 13, 14, and you're that age and you enter art contests. Uh, which I did all the time. I still do. Um, and I was I was winning first prize a lot, or I was getting I was getting scholarships. All kinds of cool things were happening for for me at the time. And then I turned fifteen, 
<laughs> dun, 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 15. 15 is a big deal because all of a sudden, 15, 16, around there, now, especially if you're doing art contests uh, outside, like, say, in, in the world, like, of professionals, now you're competing against the adults, the grown-ups, the ones who actually do it, oh. have been doing it. So uh, I entered a con an art, uh, science fiction horror convention, which I've been doing those since I was a little kid. And uh, I, like I said, when I was 14, I got standing ovations. I mean, literally, and I was proud. Talking about being full of yourself, a 14-year-old kid, right? I mean, the whole crowd was going, you know, they're cheering, and I won the first prize and all that. Then the next year comes, and all of a sudden, I, and that's where I was. I'm also at the top of the world, ma. <laughs> top of the world. I entered the next art contest. I did an even bigger piece. And I think I even made the mistake of kind of going too big because I think it had a little bit to do with what I could actually finish by the deadline. Yeah. So the art contest comes up. Um, it's, at, it's at a hotel uh, convention center in Anaheim. And uh, I'm proud of myself. I did this painting. But at the same time, I also know maybe I didn't do my absolute, absolute best. Yeah. But I figured I was so good. Didn't matter. If they gave me a standing ovation, at least maybe they'll give me a good clap, right? Uh, I enter the contest, and one of the main judges is a ju uh, an artist, a very famous, world-famous artist, one of my biggest influences on in the whole entire planet. His name is Boris Vallejo. Do you know who Boris Vallejo is? No, but maybe I'll look, look up, up Boris Vallejo. Line. He did, uh, I think, in the rock and roll, a uh, rock and roll world, he, he's known for doing the uh, Ozzy Osbourne Ultimate Sin album cover, you know, the hot chick with the demon in the background. Um, in the 70s and 80s, he was up there in the world of, of fantasy art, like like Frank Fazetta and artists like that, like the the hot chicks, you know, and the warriors, the dudes, you know, the... Uh, did, you, did you find anything? This, this dude does magic cards, I bet. Mm, Boris Vallejo, he does, he does, he's one of the... Those look like magic cards. He's one of the world's most famous uh, artists on the planet. Um, so anyways, he's the judge. Let me see. I go to do the contest, and I lose miserably. I mean, I barely got a mention, you know, in the contest. Yeah. And then, uh, and I, and my, you know, I was I was feeling pretty low. I was feeling small, smaller than I am. I think I was four eleven at the time. I fell three foot, you know. So, anyways, at the end of at the end of the whole thing, Boris Vallejo, one of the most famous world painters and artists, put, takes my painting. He flips it to the back, the back of the painting. And he sat there with me personally and wrote out this nice, long, beautiful critique about a paragraph long. And I was sitting there watching him do it. And the whole time he was doing it, I was feeling just sick in my stomach going, oh, my God, here's Boris Vallejo. And, he, and, and my work's not good enough. I didn't win the contest. You know, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't do good. And here's this famous artist judging me. And, and, but, it was, but, it was, but it wasn't so much as being judgmental as he was actually giving me a... a a very kind, uh, kind of teacher-like uh, perspective and helping me out to try to help me move along, right? So anyways, I go home. I got this, uh, my painting. He wrote on the back of it. He signed it, bit huge. There's Boris Vallejo right there on, yeah. on the screen. There you go, yeah, Fan famous there. fantasy painter. And you would think that's the kind of thing nowadays, okay? I, I mean, I'm an old man now. To me, that would be like the most prized possession I would ever have, right? You would think I would save that and even framed it just to have his signature. Um, but anyways, for a few years, that, that painting sat in the corner of my room behind other paintings. I didn't even want to look at it. I was sick to my stomach every time I looked at it or even thought about it. Uh, and I didn't have the heart to throw it away. And then one day, I literally just tore it up and threw it away because it stuck inside me all that time, you know, that I wasn't good enough or... I failed or so. I don't know what it was. You know, again, it's just a teenage kid, the, the, way, the way most teenage kids, but the way I thought anyways. And, uh, so did that, did that solve your problem inside, right, by tearing up the physical object? At the did time, the emotion go away? At the time, it went away. Uh -huh. But not long after that, a few, just a few short years after that, from that point on into this day, to this moment, <laughs> it's one of my biggest regrets <laughs> ever that I've ever experienced. And... Uh, you know, and, and it's just one of the, but you know what though, it's, it's a learning lesson, you know, uh, and, and, it, and ever since then, ever since then, I've never thrown away a sketch. I literally have boxes and shelves filled 
you know, and I keep and it. So, cause sometimes that little sketch or that little artistic idea or creative idea that you do at the moment, you might shelve it or file it is the way I put it now. And all of a sudden, next thing you know, a few years later, it might even go by and I'll have this project or something I, I want to do. And I'll go through my file of little sketches or things half that are half done or just partially done and little ideas. You don't even know what it is. And I'll turn it into something completely evolved from there and even maybe even sell it. I could say that about a lot of my monsters and my lot of werewolves. Sometimes I'll just do a little, I mean, we're talking like maybe a two, two or three inch high thumbnail sketch of something. And I just save them and save them and save them. And all of a sudden one day I go, for some, I must've had a good idea at the moment. Right. You know, <laughs> and next thing you know, it might turn into something that I, again, it might, that might become my next big painting or my next, uh, uh, way to pay my rent that month, you know, Oh, I got that right here, you know? So back to your art to anybody out there that does art. Don't be so hard on yourself, <laughs> save it, use it, learn from it and, uh, and share that encouragement with others too. Keep yeah. it going. You know, it's a love. You got to keep going. It'll, it'll keep, uh, something will come down the road from it, you know, but I think when you constantly beat yourself up and throw things away and tear things apart because, it wasn't good enough. Yeah. Um, I mean, unless you really, really, really think it's trash. I mean, I think people are just really hard on themselves. I agree with I that. I am no longer hard on myself like that. I'm cool with it. It's like I can make mistakes. I could I playing music. If I make a mistake here and there, whatever, I hit a sim, I hit a, I'm a, I'm a, I play drums, by the way, just, you know. And I, with, with me. Yeah, yeah, with we Jason. We play drums. Yeah, if, if I hit a little thing here and there and it gets in the mix somehow, well, you know what? That's just what I did that day. If you can't fix it in the studio, it's there. <laughs> oh, yeah. I've never played any show perfect, right? I don't, I, like, if you get through a song Oh, I can stage, attest to that. <laughs> and you're like somehow managed to not fuck up a single note in a song that you've performed live. Has anybody power, ever heard power of power a, to you? Has anybody heard of a band called Led Zeppelin? <laughs> 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 the great one of the greatest bands of the world. I'd say in the top three at least for sure. I always say Beatles, Stones, Zeppelin as far as the greatest bands ever. Yeah. But anyways, uh, there's a perfect example. They used to just let it fly all the time, whether oh, yeah. they were drunk or sober or whatever, and they made all kinds of noise. These were songs that they made sound godly on a, on a record that lasted forever, that they got that one great recording, but they could go on there and just play those songs through and bash it through. Uh, uh, Jimmy Page will, you know, he'll sloppily just go across his fretboard sometimes. Robert Plant can't even hit a note sometimes. He's uh, John Bonham. John Bonham, one of the greatest drummers of all, all time. I've seen him, you know, do a little stumbles here and there. John Paul Jones is always perfect, though, because he seems to be like the, the, the one who's on top of it in the band. But anyway, they just <laughs> let it fly. They just let it fly, and whatever they got that night, the crowd had a good time. Alcohol helps. <laughs> Drugs yes. and alcohol definitely helps. You'll get over hurt. it real quick. Oh, yeah. You won't, you won't worry about it so much. No, yeah. And you shouldn't worry about it. Like, hey, nobody goes up and plays perfect. Even if you go up, like, stone cold sober and you've been practicing as much as possible. Chick Corea, Alan Holdsworth. Yes, there are some. Bill Bruford. <laughs> there are some. Per Bill Bruford's perfect. I know he doesn't make a mistake. Uh, that's funny. You know, but if you ask him... Right, and you go up to his. Who, Bill Bruford? You, if you're talking to him backstage, right? right? Well, well, by the way, quick, I, I like to just throw out names. Bill Bruford, the great drummer, he played with the Yes. He's played with all the great players in the world. He's with King Crimson. He's an extremely technical drummer, um, but you know he's still loose and he and he's not like a, he's not tense or stressed. He's just technical. He's just technically perfect, and he's always been that way. It's just his nature. Yeah, he's a computer. He's a man computer. When electric drums first came out, those Simmons pads, you know, and the old, the original pads and the D drums and all that kind of stuff. Not D drums. Uh, I forgot the name of, but the the early electric drums. Yeah, were coming out. Guys like Bill Bruford back then, when they were already with the greatest drummer for Yes, and they already had all these great accomplishments. He was one of the early guys who like put the acoustic drums aside and embraced the electric drums and like said, Hey, I can make this sound like this and incorporate it in my set. And the thing about those early electric drums was, especially the Simmons pads, uh, there was a while before they actually felt good. You know, when you hit a drum and it feels like a drum or the newer pads have like a, a little bit of a response, yeah. you know, like the mesh heads and things like that. Those are the Simmons pads were like this table. I yeah. mean, they were literally like, so you had to have perfect technique 
and perfect to be, uh, and to be able to hit the, the sensor at the right spot and all those things together. So anyways, so yes, Bill Bruford is perfect. <laughs> But I was going to say, if you ask him after the show right. and you're just hanging out, you're like, how do you think you play tonight? I bet he'll be like, well, this part yeah, and this yeah, part yeah. and this part, I personally That fifth bar in that like, eighth song, yeah. I missed uh, by this much. <laughs> it's like, you know, they, they're, you're, you're always going to be your own a worst critic. Well, he's a perfectionist, too. Yeah, he, well, the guy's amazing. I think it's but, good to be a perfectionist, but you don't have to beat yourself and kill yourself uh, because you made a mistake. I agree. To err is human. <laughs> yeah. To forgive is divine. That makes me very divine. Exactly. <laughs> no, I um, I like uh, the, what was it? It was an anime I was watching. Uh, Who? Big O. It was an anime. Anime. And uh, Anime. That's the Japanese cartoons. The Japanese cartoons, cartoons right? Right, right. And so they have this robot in, in the anime, and she's learning how to play piano. Not that she needs to learn how to play piano, because she's a robot, and she can play it perfectly, but... Uh, in the show, she has to learn cadence. She has to learn to be slightly off of, right. of the uh, of the, the the metronome. Right, right. To sound like a human playing piano. Wow. To have like feeling, right? And they like, do have that by the real life. They do have that, not just in cartoons. You know, they are making yeah. robots to do everything for you, and I oh, mean yeah. everything. <laughs> but that's the important part, I think, is the mistakes or the 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 slight drift off the one that you where you're at, where where that makes it the art part of it. It's not just a machine playing I think that's notes. what makes John Bonham unique, yeah. where there's a lot of... John Bonham, the great drummer of Led Zeppelin, who every drummer tries to em emulate of or play his parts. I know I sure spent my life doing it just as, just as much. And I, and I can never say I play like John Bonham. But I know as studying John Bonham... Jason Bonham can't say he can play like John Bonham. And he's the closest one that I've heard sound like John Bonham. There's, yeah. a, there's a couple of guys out there. No, but not the, to say he's not to take away from everything. Right, but John Bonham has a way. It's, it's, it's just in his DNA. The way you just described where you sway, you, you, here's this perfect metronome that's always going and it's locked you in, but the way he could sit behind it, above it, on top of it, side, you know, he could move around it. Yeah. And, and that's his, it's what he, it's how he's breathing that day. It's how he's just feeling that day. It's, it's in the length of his arm to the end of the stick hitting that symbol. I mean, it's all those things put together that, that human element that they bring to the, the music that gives them their signature, that their signature sound, their signature style. You know that when you hear it, that's that guy. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, that's how. That's how. Uh, <clears throat> that's why it's art, right? Like that's why it's. Uh, it comes from a human. Yeah, it's you. You go and you feel energy. Although you feel you, the, vibe. the way you just described with the with the anime in the in the uh, robot chick. Yeah. You know, uh, being able to move around it and feel it. It is amazing how they are able to to do that. It's crazy. Yeah. I, you know what? I have to, I have to, we live now in a time where technology is like literally about to just like jump even further than we even think it can right now. Yeah. You know? And this has all happened just in my lifetime. I mean, when I was a little kid watching Star Trek and I first saw a Captain Kirk with talking to a communicator on a planet <laughs> with fake rocks in the background to the fake spaceship in the sky. Yeah. You know, that alone right there is like, whoa. You know, I can't even imagine that. You know, we still had, I, I literally remember being a little kid. We didn't have push buttons yet. It was still the rotary dial. Anyways, to see all the, the technology just in my lifetime to where we now have these phones and we can talk to spaceships and shuttles and we're talking to satellites that are talking to satellites that are talking to sat yeah. all around the world, 4G, 5G, 6G, all the Gs, you know, <laughs> it's, uh, I, I, I also recall in the uh, 1980, I know when it went from the 70s to, to 1980, because we went from pinball to TV Pong, to Pong. Oh, yeah. Like, like in one day, and that was the future. You know, two lines and, and, a, and a little fake, you know, digital thing going across the screen and, you know, ping pong bar, whatever it's supposed to be. Yeah. A pixel <laughs> or whatever. And just from just in, in 1980, right, that all happened. And then all of a sudden, boom, 19, the 80s was the years where everything just really just shot, you know, into a whole, we, we were literally brought into a whole new world that way. I really think right now with all the things that are going right now, psh, it's going to even go further oh, real, yeah. really quick, really quick. 
Well, uh, you kind of opened a can of worms because I love that this conversation. Yeah, I am. And I read about um, a lot of this uh, this phenomenon. Uh, like Terrence McKenna says, it's a it's a uh, shit. He says he says this big ass phenomenological word. I can't think of it. I'm gonna memorize that word right, now. Right. No, yeah. But uh, but no, you know, he's talking about um, the amount of um, of of instances that happen in in a specific amount of time, right? So when you have like the Big Bang happen and everything is just individual particles or like, you know, atoms are forming, not a lot of stuff's going on, right? right not right. A lot per second, not a lot of things are happening. Right. And over billions of years, it gets to the point where it is now where in our little center of the universe, uh, so much happens in a second, you know, and it, like it's just so much information is created, so many uh, memories and and like instances of things happening are happening so rapidly. And uh, and he says that's leading to like this spiraling end time kind of event, right? Like right. this um, singularity, which is what Ray, Ray Kurzweil refers to it as. And Ray Kurzweil is like this amazing mathematician and he's been predicting uh, what's been happening with technology for 30 plus years now. And so he goes into the whole concept of the singularity happening at like 2045, just like Terrence McKenna talks about exponential growth into this apocalyptic event of, of just like information overload. Uh, Kurzweil also says that we're going to this point where um, we don't know what's going to happen past 2045 because right. we can predict so many technologies up so to that point. So you're saying that there can only be so much? Like there's a ceiling? There's a ceiling and then we breach a threshold right to this next level of like human evolution because uh the way ray kurzweil talks about it he says um at the around the 2045 era uh you won't be able to tell the difference between a flesh and body human that was born from uh you know birth right, right, right. and a machine like cylons yeah like in cylons. A and a battlestar galactica yeah. type of uh i love battle comparison star. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, like I, cylons exactly yeah you yeah. won't be able to tell the difference well they're pretty much going in that direction right now we they we yeah, we we not me we can't help ourselves not me i'm not going nowhere i'm sticking in the cave just you know just to let you know when everything goes crazy i'll be in yeah. my cave uh, but the world around me for sure um just the fact that uh we're in the the situation we're in right now okay the pandemic everyone's experiencing right now okay the pandemic the pandemic whatever you want to call it i say it was planned so i say pandemic <laughs> screw you anyways point being is that everything shut down it stopped okay we all know that and, and if there's anything we've learned is that it can, yes it can happen overnight it did happen overnight when you shut everything down and you reset it, you don't do it with the idea of the just doing exactly what you were doing before. You, you unleash or reveal these new other things that you've had going. You try to, quote unquote, improve upon it, make it more advanced, get more out of it. And whoever's running and pulling all the strings, I can't tell you right now because I don't know. But I know that ultimately that if, you're gonna, if we are going to reset it, it's not going to be with the intentions of doing it exactly the same way that it was before. Yeah. It was to, like you're talking about, this, the, the, we're talking about the, the advance and evolution of technology. Right now is the time. You know, the, it, whether it's with our finances and our money and our monetary system, um, and you're talking about Cylons, how crazy that sounds. <laughs> We're, of 25 course, years we already of uh, have, technological we are, growth. We already have, uh, you know, fake arms and legs and all kinds of things yeah. that could attach to your brain and, and control things. Um, yeah, you, can, you can get a cochlear implant uh, if you lose wait, your Wait, wait, what? It's called the cochlear <laughs> implant. It's for your cochlea as part of your hearing, oh, okay. part of your ear. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, uh, and they bypass uh, straight into the nervous system, mm -hmm. right to your brain. Crazy. And they just hook a microphone up and look on, and, and it seems like it's like just like a large diaphragm uh, magnetic moving coil microphone hanging out on top of their head. Wow. But, uh, and they, I, it's, I, like, I, it's like the South Park episodes. Yeah. You know, when Cartman has the antennas and he's <laughs> talking yeah. to people around the world. Oh yeah, that's totally it's coming. Happening. That's coming soon. It's yeah. all happening. We could definitely transmit right other people saying stuff into that implant for sure because it picks up whatever you're hearing already. So right, right? Um, see that's the that's the thing too. I want to just kind of hit upon. It's like uh, a lot of folks are they could they would consider other people conspiracy theorists because and they would say, well, 
you already have a phone. You already have a digital instrument in your hand all the time. And whoever's looking at you knows where you're going already and all these things. Yeah. True, of course. But now what you mix it all, all into your, your body, you, uh, like the Cylons or the, the, the future of, of, of what you're talking about where we're, com we're combining humans and machines, basically. Yeah, it's where, inevitable. You know, uh, and then you're going to get to the point where you're not only just being able to be tracked, but yeah. they can also send signals. They yeah. could control and I actually do, um, you know, I do the corporate stuff, and I've been in a lot of conventions where they talk about the levels of security that they're getting together, you know, and there's always going to be people trying to break in the back door of uh, these levels of security, but they know that this is getting to that point where right. it's it's serious. Like, we can't be messing around. People can, you know, in, in 10, 15 years start being actually hacked. Short amount of time. And, like I mean, you said, it's going to happen quick, you know? Yeah, yeah, because they're implementing live, uh, you know, updates and stuff for their implants. And so that's all, if they can connect to an Internet source, right, then somebody can, can get in. So Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, there you go. There's your future, kids. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I, 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 so security is key. I've, I, I always fought even just having a savings account at my bank, you know, an ATM card and a number. I've always kind of uh, fought technology or tried to put things off. But no matter how, all the people it's that say that they it. right, the people that say they're going to live off the grid and all these things. You can't. It's yeah. pretty much you're part of the society. It, I think to me, though, I guess what makes me upset or not angry but definitely disturbs is the fact that if you control technology, that you control how the world works. In other words, you as a person, you, I, don't, I don't get a choice if, uh, to keep the old phone or the old <laughs> something old because it's old and I like the way it works. If I don't keep up with the new technology, I'm out. Well, that's our economic you know? system, you know, and like everybody's, uh, it's like great inventions come from great minds and then they create this structure, this corporate structure, and then they get people in there that are really good at just pushing the button. What does the button do? It makes it better. I don't give a fuck how, make <laughs> right, it better. Right. And then next year we're going to make it better. And, uh, and it's like, well, it was great. What if I already it like great. it? It's yeah. fine. I already like it. Like you don't need to make it better, <laughs> yeah. right? But they have like they have quarterly earnings that they need to make, and how do they make those? They make it better, right? And they're just a, that's their this 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 feedback loop of of uh, advancement that's just occurring for no reason besides making money. Yeah, and well, we're st we're stuck in that. We're stuck. Yeah. We're basically held hostage to that world you know we're, we're we're part of it we're sucked into it it's inevitable i call it sucked into the vortex we're all sucked into the vortex yeah but in the meantime like i said i'm still the cave i'm the cave dude <laughs> you know i uh, i'm a, i like it that way uh i'm okay i actually enjoy not having all those things and i'm even getting to the point now where uh, i am turning things off more often uh, turning off the phone, especially right oh, yeah. now. Like usually, when like uh, the reason I would have my phone for nor under normal circumstances is to like a job's coming in. You know, you're gonna go make some money, a gig. We're musicians. A gig. Someone called me for a gig, and I used to play in 20 bands. So I still do, hopefully someday. But I did at one point, and no matter what, there was always something going. So you always got to make sure you're kind of up on all those things. And or and now that that's not happening, there's less communication on that level and it's more just seeing people complain and whine and being angry and just yeah. you know bitching about everything so uh, it's easier to turn it off and put it down you I've know i totally tried to unplug as much as possible personally yeah. and because you know they're going to plug you back in anyways eventually one way or the other you know you're going to get plugged one way oh, yeah. i'm dreading it honestly man yeah me I've, too. I've really found a nice peaceful place you know and like centered myself in this like having time and being able to just work like this and uh and going back and being on that ridiculous schedule of like 16 hours a day for weeks on end i'm not looking forward to that you know having when, all my time taken from me like that when the shutdown first occurred back in mid-march and there was a moment sometime about a month into it when well, everybody's getting restless but we also did notice you know we were kind of spending more time at home the sky was a little clearer less uh things going on i and it almost gave me the sense of i mean i don't want to live we can't live like that we look they're not going to keep just issuing people checks every day and take care of everybody it doesn't yeah. work that way 
you got to go out and work. You got to make things happen. But it wouldn't be a bad idea. I don't know if it's once a year, maybe once every couple of years. Let's the whole world take a break, you know, shut yeah. it down, shut it down, you know, let's shorten our work weeks. Why do we got to work five days and get, maybe get two days. Some people work in seven days. Let's work yeah. four days, take three days off, whatever, well, you know. They're used to that old system, the, the, uh, the factory system that we fought tooth and nail for, which was, you know, just 40 hours a week right. because they're working people to death. Right. And they're like, we get two days off and we're working eight hours a day yeah. with a lunch. With yeah. a lunch. <laughs> yeah, you, you know what lunch. I mean? Because yeah. that's how people were being you treated. You time for a sandwich. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and now here we are, you know, so many years later, and uh, it's like they still only give you like two weeks of vacation out of the year. So you're like, you're doing you for two weeks and you're doing them for 50 weeks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's like, is money worth that? No. It's really not. No. And, um, and there's plenty of other countries out there that do all kinds of great, uh, you know, vacation and like maternity leave, paternity leave. Like we would never do paternity leave in America. Right. Right. But like other countries just do it. Because of course you do that, and yeah, it's uh, part of the deal. Yeah, it's like life is important, and the money will be earned. But in America, it's like earn that money, motherfucker. You don't have a life. I hope that pe- uh, I hope that people and they want to keep it that way. People in general, well, we could hopefully at least learn something from all this, and maybe those will be part of our new demands or the way we try to negotiate how we want to live our lives. You know. Yeah. I can only hope, anyways. That that would be the way to go, you know. Because hey, life is too short, man. You don't want to say you spent all your whole life just working just to be able to pay for rent. It goes by so fast. You're giving away money that has no nothing in value afterward. <laughs> yeah. And you're giving up all your time for yeah, it. Yeah. All of your time. You know that those are you don't just get to continue to be whatever age you are. You know those are those are your your precious hours of existence and you're just giving them up for money and hopefully a lot. Well, that's why we do what we love. (laughs) You have to do what you love, man. You have to, you have to do what you would. That's why I do what I do. Right. I'd be doing it anyways. Yeah. I would literally be doing it anyway. During the, during this whole time that we haven't been uh, out gigging and working, uh, I've been very fortunate to where, uh, you know, because I do art and and music, I kind of already have that in me. Um, but that's always my go-to when there's nothing going on, even when I wasn't working or if I was hungry and like, oh, I need a job, I need to work. And if I have time to myself, whatever time it is, I'm going to break out my watercolors. I'm going to break out my drumsticks. I'm going to listen to some music that I love, my old, my Rush albums, you know, uh, and just sit there with my headphones on and, and just go into my, I, you know, my little kid world when I was a little kid. You know, when you first started loving all this stuff and you did it because you really loved it. You just kind of find that that place, yeah. And just go there, and usually something will come of it. And so I have been a, uh, been painting a lot. Uh, I've sold one painting already since the beginning of the lockdown, and it kind of helped help pay for for a rent for a month, you know. But it was helpful. But it was just doing what I wanted to do, and I was inspired. Uh, I just finished a, a record or an album. Do we still call them albums. I call them albums. If it's yeah. a collection of songs, I figure it's an album. Yeah. Uh, I just finished an album with my ba- my original band Bong, which is my labor of love. When it comes to Bong, music. as you can see the T-shirt that uh, Jason Froberg uh, is sporting. Very, I'm very proud, by the way. I love and this it's shirt. Fa- you know, it's a cool shirt. You know, someone really likes your stuff when it's faded and they've worn it enough times to wash it and the ink come off of the shirt. That all day, baby. <laughs> that's a concert shirt. So. <laughs> Uh, it's like the, the, the suicidal shirt. I, I've beat up this thing over the years, you know. Uh, but anyway, so I, I there was a studio in Vegas called the Tone Factory. Oh yeah, those guys do great. Uh, work. Great, a great producer, uh, Vinny Castaldo. He's uh, also a great drummer, and uh, I had the opportunity to go in there before I made this album. I went in there with another project. And I got, you know, it was a big deal. You know how it is when you get to go into a cool studio. It's yeah. just it's just a great experience. And Vinny's got this great, you know, console, one of the, the Triton. I don't know the different names of all the different, uh, 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 the equipment, but it's like yeah. this huge, huge console and uh, a separate drum room and all these different rooms were separated. And the drum set that he has, it's an awesome Ludwig kit. And it's got like 13 microphones on it at all times, right? And I went in there and I did my first session with a band and 
it was a real simple session, nothing crazy, just some really cool, cool rock. And I sat there on the couch, like I'm sitting here now and I'm listening to it through the speakers. There it is right there on the screen. Yeah, there's Vinny's studio, the Tone Factory in Las Vegas. Vinny Castaldo, call him, man. Uh, he, anyway, so I, I sat there for the first time and I heard my, just my drums. You know when the drum, when, when you're listening back to the music and you're just listening to the drum track. Yeah. I know this sounds arrogant because I'm a drummer and yes, I am very arrogant, but my point is that when you hear the drums and the sa- drums sound great, that you don't even want to hear music over it at that point because it just sounds so good. You know you're at a great foundation and a great start. You know that the drums are going to sound awesome and everything on top of it is just going to make it sound that much better. So I sat there and I listened to it and I went, man, I got to record my album here, you know? And that's the first time I've really felt that way, you know? And he's a drummer. He knows what he's doing. Uh, and the other thing was, too, as a producer, I was able to take a – instruction you know learn i mean I, I was using heavier sticks he was telling me to slow down speed up you know if he didn't like something he made, made me do it over kind of like a coach you know hey dude you, you know that really didn't have the energy you know what musician wants to hear that they suck in a studio <laughs> um, but you know but it's in a good way it's in a constructive way to get you know to motivate and to get what you want out of it so i spent uh i spent the band spent the past two years um, in the studio, laying tracks, working on the album, and uh, uh, some of the music we had written even years before that, and and ultimately we finally did it. And during the this whole time of the pandemic, we've decided, you know what, whatever little bit of money we have, what time we have, let's finish this album. Let's just get it done. You know, um, let's feel like and, and and having that time we've been talking about, right, to actually go into the studio and do all that. Well, I'm very happy and proud to say that it's done. It's, uh, it's out on iTunes and Apple Music and Google Play and Spotify. Uh, if you go in, you type in on your computers, your internets, bong, and then space, destroy all humans. Uh, if you go to any of those sites, it's on all those sites. You could buy the album. I think you could buy it for 99 cents a song or eight bucks for the whole album. And uh, it's out there. It's out in the world. We've made a few videos here to kind of promote the album, too. Um, and it's out there, and I'm happy about it. And, and uh, hopefully uh, some of our friends or people who are watching right now might take a chance and listen to some of it. And uh, tell me what you think or if you, tell me if it sucks. But I think you're going to love it, and we're really happy with it, man. Nice, nice. I think I found it right here, buddy. You got a computer. It should be right. Oh, there's a few. Oh, there you go. I am so Can you, can you type in some different songs? Yeah, man. Do the same thing. Do Planet X. Bong. Planet X. <laughs> All right, tight. Yeah, this is cool. I didn't know you could do this. It's like actually, I could actually preview my shit on your show. Yeah, dude. And it's, <laughs> it's nice when it's not on um, YouTube, because if it's on YouTube, they uh, demonetize the, the show. So it's like when you can find it on different places like that, right. then you can actually play it, which is tight. And I am looking for it. Hang on. You're on YouTube? No, no, no. I'm just searching Google. Oh, uh, I guess it'll be on YouTube. Yeah, it should be yeah, on YouTube. I can't play it if it's on YouTube. Okay, forget it. Forget it. Who cares? Go yeah. buy the album. You saw you got a little taste of it. Go go. type in on any of those internet uh, digital, what do you call it, digital media distribution iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, uh, Napster. There's, yes, there's still a Napster out there. Don't tell Lars Ulrich. <laughs> there's really a Napster still? I yeah, know there's a Napster. That's crazy. Now I'm going to look up Napster. That's funny. I, uh, I remember using Napster growing up. Oh, there is a Napster. Look at that. Sign up now. Show everybody Napster. Bam! Still got Napster wow. online. Yeah, there's still Napster. That's crazy. Whatever. So, okay, Jason, now that we do have this uh, pandemic going on, yes, I'm going to keep saying that. Yeah, whatever. Uh, when are we going to start doing uh, For some of the listeners out there, the viewers, 
I can't believe there's people watching this right now. Uh, yeah, Jason Froberg it. here happens to be. I my nickname for him is Les Claypool Jr. I like that. That's a great nickname. I'll take because it. Because anybody out of aside from Les Claypool, the great bass player, lead singer, the almighty. icon, yeah, a legend from the band Primus. Uh, you're got to be the only person I've ever met in my life or seen that actually emulates and plays and sings like Les Claypool, like you're Les Claypool Jr., you know? I love that And shit. Uh, you have the band called uh, Blue Collared Bastards. Yeah. And you played with us uh, on my birthday. I'm very honored to say that I've had because I'm a huge Primus fan and, and uh, Tim Herb Alexander is one of my favorite drummers, like a lot of other people, very influenced by him. He lives here in town. He plays with the Blue Man Group. What? Yeah. Are you serious? I'm dead serious. Wait, wait. What? So you're saying that the next time Blue Man Group actually plays, he'll will be able to see her? You can just go see her play Blue Man. Wow, that's awesome. We'll have to talk to our good buddy Jeff Tortura and see if he could hook us up with that. We definitely will. I'll have to have Jeff on the show, and then I'll, like, finagle my way in. Yeah, yeah, that's I mean. how we do it, you know. No, Jeff is great, actually. We were, um, so... Me and Polly D, the the original drummer from the band, and Anthony, the guitar player, we all went to Primus when they were here in Vegas. Right. And of course, we were eating mushrooms and having a good time. Uh, yeah, yeah. It's a Primus show. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I've shroomed and seen Primus quite a few times over the years. That's the way to do it, right? First time I ever saw Primus, I was frying my brains out. Oh. Uh, and that... I said I wouldn't. Yeah. You know, it's one of those, <laughs> I always do that. I go, nah. I'm not going to fry. I'm not going to fry. No, uh, no. And about an hour or so before Primus came on, I uh, was at, uh, I'm going to take you there. Uh, Gathering of the Tribes was the name of the concert in Costa Mesa, California, over there in, uh, I forgot the name of the, the actual amphitheater. But anyways, all my friends were frying their brains out. It was an all-day concert. Fishbone was a headliner. Uh, King's X play. And I think Ice T. Uh, it was a very eclectic crowd. Uh, and Primus was like in the middle somewhere. And it was the first time I had ever seen Primus. And I just heard of Primus. So it's like 1990, 91. Or oh, yeah, a long time. Way before your time. The good time. Yeah, so it was the best I mean, time. They, they were all good. And all my, mean, were frying on awesome. all my friends are frying on acid. Uh -huh. And it's about an hour or so before Primus comes on. And I'm just like sneaking through the seats, you know, trying to weasel my way to the front. And I see one of my good friends. I went with like 20 people, but we all, I always disperse from all my friends when we go to concerts. We just like, we kind of go together. Yeah. And then we just kind of meet along the way and then we all find our way home somehow. That's so how anyway, it goes sometimes, especially if you're tripping. Right, exactly. So they're all frying their brains out. I knew it. And, and all of a sudden, I, I kind of weasel my way down into the front first few 10 rows. And all of a sudden, I look right next to me. It's one of my best friends that I was there with. Right, I hadn't seen him the whole time, and he looked at me, and he had this fucking Chinese eyed smile. You know, his eyes. He was just like he was actually just a. Uh, he was just frying his brains out. You know? <laughs> <laughs> he was just frying hard, but he had this big smile, and he looked at me, and I looked at him, and I'm just like, I'm almost like, like you know, what are you fucking smiling about, you know? And he looks at me, and then he goes like this. Uh, I could do this now because we got video. He, he had his finger like this, and he had a tab of acid on his finger. Ah! And he goes, and he's smiling. He's having such a fucking good time. And I told myself I was not going to fry. <laughs> and, he, and he had the, the acid on his finger, and I went like this. Nah. <laughs> and he went, ah. Uh, <laughs> so then that's I was, so, great. so that's it. I'm on the fucking train now. I'm not getting off or nothing. I'm stuck. And about, I don't know, 45 minutes, an hour later or so, Primus comes on. I see Primus for the first time ever. It's my first ever Primus concert. I'm like ten, dead center, about 10 rows back. And, you know, moshing. You know, kids are just moving around and moshing. And you could feel it, too. It was like, it was like before even Primus hit the stage, it's, like, it's broad daylight. And you could see all these people just start to kind of mosey towards the stage, like, it, this energy and now the yeah. acid is just starting to you know <laughs> you i'm just starting to feel like singes of it right yeah and all of a sudden i'm noticing the energy of people coming at me towards the stage primus is about to come on stage i could feel it now all of a sudden the acid's actually kicking in i knew this because when i saw someone smoking a joint yeah the smoke just had this real cool 3d effect to it 
And uh, I go, oh, shit. The fascination It's begins. happening. It's starting. And then all of a sudden, Les Claypool hits the fucking stage. And he's got that big fucking, is it a war? I don't know if it's a Warwick base, the big wooden. Uh, it's, looking. um, no, it's, it's, hang on, I'll show you. Okay, but anyways, he's got that big giant monster base with the giant fat neck, you know? And and they were still young, you know, they they were still kind of kids then, you know, they were still kind of, had a hippie kind of vibe to them, you know, they weren't, they weren't even wearing costumes, there was no stage props or nothing like that. It was just the three of those guys. And it was literally right when Sailing of the Seas of Cheese just literally got released like that week or somewhere around there. And uh, anyways, they were fucking awesome. There's the bass. Yeah, Carl <laughs> Thompson makes his basses for him. They're custom made, man. They're beautiful, but they're like 12 grand a piece. And he's beating up on this bass and singing and bouncing around the stage, going crazy, man. And the and the crowd is just losing it. You know how, how the whole crowd goes up and down and the, the motion and the acid was really kicking in by then. Anyways, Jason Froberg is the only other guy Ow! I know that could actually emulate Les Claypool in his prime. <laughs> He's still in his prime, bro. That man crushes it. Yeah, when, yeah, I, yeah. when I go see him play, he he does things now, right, which is so fun for me to have like put so much effort in to like memorizing all these sure. uh, yeah, yeah. songs. You and studied then, it. And then I go and see him play. And he's changed the way he plays it, or I'm doing it a little different. But I think, but it seems like he's doing things more challenging for himself live while he's, he's on stage. He's evolving. Yeah, he hasn't stopped for like, sure. Like for example, when he plays "My Name Is Mud" and it's all right. Uh, so it's kind of this uh, thumbed roll off thing, right? Like right. 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 But if you look at my right, my right hand. It's kind of absorbing the roll off. Right. When I see him play live, this motherfucker is dang. <laughs> like yeah, that. See, he's doing it with what? It's, it's like John Bonham with strokes. his right foot. He's like, yeah. people do things on double bass. Some drummers could just like do things fast with one foot. You it's know? crazy. Yeah. Well, and, there you go. And when, he plays the whole song like that. And when you're that great, you just get better. You know, you just yeah. keep playing it, you get better. He, instead of uh, 10,000 hours, he's probably got 100,000 hours. They do tours nonstop. <laughs> he's got one of the best careers I've ever seen as a musician, man. Like, he just does what he likes to do. Yeah. And he's always playing with new people and, like, creating these cool projects. And then, there, I did it. Moving on. Yeah. You know, like, album, tour, what's next? Go back yeah, to Primus, yeah. he, fuck around a bit. He plays with Stu, has a project with Stuart Copeland. Yeah. Called Oysterhead. Of course, he's got you know all his. He he's got literally about five or six or ten different projects with his name in it. Les Claypool and the Flying Frog Brigade. Um, yo, bucket of burning brain. Okay, I got I got I got another, I got another quick story then uh, when it comes to uh, Primus, and this has to do with Buckethead. You ever heard of Buckethead? Of course, yeah. <laughs> okay, Buckethead. So, I just moved to Petaluma, Cal. Or I moved to the Bay Area and I went to a concert at Petaluma where Primus is from, uh, somewhere around ninety eight. 98, 99, in between there. And they did a live video shoot. I forgot the name of it. It's pretty well known, a live concert at the Phoenix Theater in Petaluma. So anyways, I get there early because I, I, I don't know anybody that well in the Bay Area. And I just, I'm by myself with my dog. I drive in my truck and I go to Petaluma, California. And I was going to get there early just in case I could see them come into the, you know, into the show or whatever. Uh, I get there plenty early. There's nobody there. It's dead. Completely just like nobody's around. I feel like a knucklehead because I'm the only one who's hanging out behind this uh, theater in the middle of Petaluma, California. And I'm waiting and hanging out. I'm smoking joints by myself, just kind of killing time till the show starts. And this little teeny beat up, looked like a Datsun B210 from the 80s, early 80s car, rolls up. Okay, little car, faded brown, beat up looking thing, rickety fucking piece of shit, ultimately. And uh, it was almost like a, a clown, like how, you know, you know how it looks like when a tall person gets out of a, a car, you know, it's like a clown. It's like, <laughs> like, a, like a circus act. Yeah. That this big, tall, skinny guy gets out of this car, this little beat up car behind the theater. I didn't know who it was. It looked like some just normal dirtbag dude. That's how pretty much what I'm just telling you what I saw. Oh, some, some guy, maybe he's a roadie, right? He had a guitar and a case, and I think he even had a small lamp. So I thought maybe he was just working with the band or something like that. And he had a bucket of KFC, 
or what looked to like be like a bucket of KFC. So I'm thinking to myself, this is guy. He must be working for the band. He's some local hippie stoner dude. And he's just showing up early to lo- unload some equipment, right? Big, tall guy with frizzy hair coming out of the sides, real stoic looking, you know, not smiling, just kind of doing his thing. Anyway, so, but I was just looking at that bucket, like that KFC bucket. I'm like, what's the KFC bucket? Oh, it must be lunch for the band, right? The show starts out a couple, few hours later. It's Primus is jamming. At this time, Brain is the drummer. Yeah. Uh, it's, not, it's not Herb Alexander. It's when Brain first joined the band. Oh, excuse me. If you want to get into the real history, it wasn't when he first joined the band, but he was the drummer at the time. <clears throat> so anyway, so they're playing on, and doing their thing and having a good time. And it's a great show. And then uh, Les Claypool, they start playing a song and they introduce Buckethead. I never even heard of Buckethead at the time. Yeah. I don't know who he was. And he, they started talking about him, introducing him like he's some legend, you know? Like he's, uh, you know, from, I forgot how, he, uh, you know, Les Claypool, he's got a grand way of being a, a Ringling Brothers Circus kind of uh, yeah, the MC. announcer. Yeah, he's got a great MC thing about him. And he's introducing Buckethead. And then this big, tall guy with frizzy hair with a jumpsuit, the orange jumpsuit, with wearing a fucking KFC thing on his head. And I'm like, that's the dude behind the, the theater earlier, you know? So I saw Buckethead before I even saw him on stage. That's I funny. saw what he looked like as just some dude getting out of the car, some yeah. freaky tall dude getting out of this little beat-up car, <laughs> you know? And then from that point on, literally that year, 98, going into 99, he became like this world phenomenon. I mean, ultimately played for Guns N' Roses. <laughs> yeah. Oh, he's a shredder, man. <laughs> oh, yeah. He was fucking shredding, dude. Oh, my God. The guy's a monster. I mean, yeah. it would be a privilege to play with that guy even one song. I yeah, mean, I love Bucky. so yeah. talented. From that point on, I just had this. And I started laughing at myself just because of, of the fact that I looked. Again, here's about uh, uh, trying to just define a little bit of, of what it's like to just to kind of judge someone when you first see them. Yeah. I, this is what I did. My judgment of some guy getting out of the back of the car. He, how was I to know he's going to be one of the uh, most famous guitar players on the planet after that? You know, it was uh, cool. Good for him. I was happy for him. I saw, yeah, I followed yeah. Buckethead's career a little bit. That's awesome. Now they did that whole, uh, bucket of burning brains album and, and it was pretty, pretty ripping stuff. Yeah. Man. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They, uh, there's a song on there that I want to cover, and of course I can't think of the name of it, but I'm definitely gonna. It's it's a fucking weird ass. Song. I like playing in the Primus band with you because you get, you like to play the old cool stuff off, like the stuff I was telling you that I first saw saw them play at yeah. the Gathering of the Tribes that uh, off of uh, Frizzle Fry and and uh, Selling a Seeds of Cheese, you know those songs. It's like. Whenever we actually play those songs, I'm like a little kid, man. I'm Me just too. like having fun playing them, you know. When uh, are we gonna do that? Are we gonna do that? We, where's our guitar he, player? Where's I Anthony? Know. He's moving. He's moving his house. Where? And he's dealing with his kids and like you know he's got a bunch of stuff going on. See right what now. happens when you have kids and families and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> no, he's got he got himself a new house though, man. It's a little good for, for him. him. And, well, uh, tell him to get his shit together and hurry up so he can play some music. <laughs> Yeah, no, we'll we'll be playing. Some go music, put the boxes man. in the corner and let's go play some music. Uh, I'm into it, man. Yeah, we'll be playing, man. We'll be playing. This whole this whole uh, pandemic, as you call it, sir, is uh, I don't really just call fucking that. stuff yeah. up, man. Yeah, it sure is. It, it's <laughs> really putting a damper on everything, and uh, yeah, I don't know. It's hard. It's hard to get together and jam when there's no shows and no future, and it's just like God. No shows and no future. How uh, bleak is that? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. It's just it's so demotivating. Do you think that they'll bring back the speakeasies? You know what I mean? Like you know, in the old days and the prohibition days, it's like you know. People had to go have like little underground. They're already doing that. That's you know? already happening. Cops are busting parties. Yeah, but they're stupid about it. I mean, yeah. come on. They're they're on their roofs partying and jumping in the. They got thousands of people in their backyard. That's not going to work that way. Speakeasies are definitely more like. All right, I I know about this place. You know, <laughs> this way you can just knock three times on the door. Da da da. You know. Oh uh, well, one of the smaller casinos secret decoder was, uh... rings, things like that. You know. Oh yeah. No, one of the smaller casinos was putting bands on, even Which when they one? were all, all supposed to be doing it. I, uh, I'm not going to say. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I want them to keep putting bands on. Yeah, uh, keep yeah, yeah. Keep fucking yeah, going, know, man. Uh, but, uh, no. Uh, Especially in Vegas, because Vegas is that yeah. kind of town where it's like, 
they do everything on the down low. Yeah. You know? It just shoots like across Facebook real quick and then people yeah. show up. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, if anybody knows of anything, uh, contact us here at uh, Jason's house. Spacebrain85 at Gmail. Spacebrain85 at Gmail. That's yeah, the uh, email that's address. That's my email, yeah. You can send stuff to that. Spam it up. Nice. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, so tell me about the origin of Stoner, dude. The origin of Stoner, dude? The origin of Stoner, dude. Okay, so... Uh, 20 years ago, 21 years ago. Actually, no. I'm thinking uh, time flies, man. Yeah. Don't get old. All right? <laughs> Just don't get old. Whatever you do. 25 years ago, because I'm thinking, wow, 95? Yeah. Uh, I came up with a cartoon character. I'm a cartoonist. I, and the cartoon character was very simple. It was a Charlie Brown kind of simple circles artwork kind of thing. And it was basically me and my life, you know, stories or whatever, my fun stories with my friends. And I, I gave it a generic name, Stoner Dude, like a generic name. Like if we call all our friends, we call each other Stoner Dude. Or, hey, I was just some Stoner Dude, you know? Yeah. It's a definition, it's a description. Uh, so anyway, so I came up with this cartoon character, and it's just one of those things that, when, again, one of my uh, many projects I just kind of put it down. If I don't do anything with it, I'll just put it away for a little while and, and pick it up later. So I came up with this idea cartoon. And then right around that time, uh, South Park came out. And, and I was thinking to myself when I first saw South Park, man, that's kind of like my idea, you know. <laughs> it's like, you know, the simple Charlie Brown cutout kind of characters, you know, and they're all cussing and talking about all kinds of crazy shit and you know, and it's a great cartoon. I'm a huge South Park fan. I, I always admire those those who use my ideas before I do. Uh, but anyway, so <laughs> so like anything else, I just kind of put it aside. And uh, same thing with the name Bong for the band Bong. I, I can't, my band Bong was like I call it my imaginary band. You know, it's in my my brain, in my head. Yeah. You know, I'm playing tours, I'm playing concerts, I got songs written, we got albums out, and it's gonna be called Bong, you know? So anyway, so I put Stoner Dude on a shelf for a little bit, and then I moved to the Bay Area uh, a few short years after that, Northern California from Orange County. And uh, I moved to the Bay, and I started listening to, I, for some reason I started listening to ra like talk radio more often than the bullshit that the music they play it's always just something in the background you know while you're driving or, or doing whatever and uh, i started listening to a sports talk radio show uh, and and there were a raider state of uh, oakland raider station and i was listening to some radio talk show and uh, i noticed a lot of fans that were calling in as callers yeah. well first of all the fact that they let you call i'm like oh shit they're letting you you can call and then, yeah, it's funny. Uh, here's Radio 101, by the way. If you're a caller out there, for, you like to call radio shows, you just pick up the phone, you dial the number that they tell you about, that tell you to call, and you dial it until they pick up. <laughs> and that's all you do. <laughs> just be ready to have something to say. So anyway, so uh, I call these radio, Raider radio shows. Uh, a lot of, some of the subject matter has been about drugs or pot or whatever. Cause back then, you know, people would get busted for weed and da da da. Yeah. And that's usually what spurred me to call, you know, and I'm usually looking for a one liner. I'm not like Mr. Hey, I got this opinion and I really want to get my point across. I'm looking for a punchline. You yeah. Know? I'm a fan of like Groucho and Abbott and Costello, the old days of radio. That's why I was so uh, in, interested in calling radio shows because I love radio. I love broadcasting. I love the history. Anyways, and I love comedy. So I started calling a show, and, and uh, as I was on hold, waiting to talk on my very first ever radio show, it was about Kareem Abdul-Jabbar getting busted for weed in, on the freeway in L.A. or something oh. like that, right? This is 1999. And uh, so anyways, all these different callers had these nicknames I was noticing that were calling the shows, and they were calling you by your nickname. So... I decided at that moment, since I was calling about weed and I had no other nickname and I didn't want to be like everybody else, I said, Stoner Dude, <laughs> thinking about my little cartoon character that I created. And uh, so I got on the air and uh, I talked. I got a couple laughs out of the host, afternoon host, who was doing afternoon drive. 
And just from that call, that very first call, I noticed like that next day later, early in the morning, I had my radio on in the background uh, as I was sleeping in the morning, and it was very low. And I and and in half half asleep state, half awake, half asleep state, I heard them use my call as a commercial for for their morning, you know, just during the during the day morning drive. They used my voice and my name as like a part of a commercial, you know. And I heard that. It's like this light bulb just went off in my head. I heard that. I thought of the character. And from that point on, I just go, you know what? I'm going to have fun with the stoner did thing. And I started calling on a regular basis. And the next thing you know, I'm a regular caller. Next thing you know, I'm being invited to the radio stations. And I'm getting to know the people that run the radio stations. Next thing you know, people who work at the radio stations are calling me in to come in and do some voiceovers and have some fun. And I'm like... Wow, this is cool. And from that point on, because I was calling a lot about the Raiders on the Raider Raider radio station, um, I ended up starting to get to know a lot of Raider players and a lot of the fans. And it just kind of blew up from there. And then from that point on, I just said, you know what, man, I'm going to roll. Oh, wait, let me stop for a second. Back up. There was a point I was in the parking lot of the Oakland Coliseum. And I'm walking around with the host of the radio show because we're now we're becoming friends. And they know him as the host of the radio show. And he's going to all the different tailgate parties in the, uh, in the parking lot, having fun, getting ha- people are giving us beers and food and stuff. And we came upon across a couple different people, and I introduced myself, and I said, my name is Michael. And after we had this conversation, my buddy who worked at the – now he's my buddy – the guy is like the, working at the radio station as the host, daily host. He looks at me, he goes, dude, nobody cares about Michael. They want to talk to Stoner, dude. Yeah. And like this weird thing went on in my head where I'm like, I had two things that went on in my head. It first was like, but I'm Michael, you know, but I'm me. No, you're not. And no, no, they don't care about that guy. <laughs> they they want to hear the guy that makes people laugh on the radio and have a good time. And his name's Stoner, dude. And he talks about weed, you know. So it's, so it's kind of a, another little lesson learned, you know. And again, back to the beginning of the show, this little sketch idea I had that I felt got gypped by South Park and all this other stuff going on in my head, I had to put it aside. All of a sudden, I'm picking it up and using it for this other thing that's taking me in this whole new direction in radio and broadcasting. And, and that helped me as a musician because what does every musician want to do in there? Or what do they want? They want to hear their music on the radio. Now all of a sudden these people that are working at the radio stations are using my music as outro music and intro music and things like that, talking about my band, saying my band's name, things like that. So I just, once I saw Stoner Dude kind of become something out of nothing, I pretty much embraced it and said, well, fuck it. I'm stoner, dude. Oh, you yeah. Know, You're stoner, dude. You're stoner, dude. We're all stoner, dude. But I'm fucking stoner, dude. <laughs> you know? And I started signing it on my cartoons and things like that. And, and you know, it, it, it gets a lot of controversy as far as, like, because I'm a comic book artist, a lot of little kids and families come up to me and see my art and they see they they sit and look at my art and they admire it and they'll say some nice things about it and then some like old lady grandma will look down and go stoner dude what's that <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was like, that's great. my name don't wear it out yeah man yeah a lot of people are still hung up on the uh the weed propaganda from uh the olden days yeah but that's fine though seriously it's yeah. like uh, good, good controversy, bad. What it's, it's controversy is controversy. You yeah. know, you, there's an old saying, so say my name, say it right. Say it twice. Say it, say it all day long. Just keep saying it. Yeah. You know? It doesn't matter what you're saying about me. Just keep saying my name, <laughs> you know, and they'll, they'll remember you. And usually if you have something to show for it though, and you have something, uh, they're going to see you for who you are at the end of the day, whoever it is, you know? Yeah. But you're roping them in with the controversy. <laughs> and I also never want to give anybody the impression that I'm not a stoner. Yes, I do want to hit that. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, man. Whenever there's someone in the room and they've got a joint or a bong or a pipe and they're looking around for someone to smoke it with, I'm usually the first this one to guy. just, I cozy up right away. 
I make friends. And I share. Yeah. I share. If I have, I share. Of course. Yeah. Sharing is caring. That's right. Weed is love, man. We spread it around. <laughs> it grows, man. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful, man. I love it. I freaking love it. Yeah, we used to fucking get down back in the day, man. What do you mean by get down? What do you mean? Just smoking way too much weed. Yeah, yeah. I noticed that. I, I did, too. I think I smoked too much at first. But I'm okay. I mean, I'm glad I did. I mean, I, you have to smoke it a lot to figure out you're smoking too much. But, <laughs> but um, yeah, yeah, I think. I when, can't make memories anymore. I, I think, think I need to slow down. I think when you're young, when you're younger, you just you just want to consume and consume and consume. Yeah. You know? A lot of pot, a lot of alcohol, a lot of food, a lot of bacon, double cheeseburgers, a Carl's Jr., a lot of Funyuns. I want a lot of everything. Oh. I used to do all that. Now it's like, you know, everything in moderation. Big time. Steadily, but not as much. You don't need to, like, kill yourself every day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> You can kill yourself with food in this country, too, man. It's real yeah, easy. It's, yeah. You're driving around. It's like, fuck, I got to go. Uh, I'm going to go an extra two miles out of the way to go get something healthy. It's, you know what? I, I want to hit on that. Uh, like, so let's know. I, I like to bounce around. Yeah. We're talking about the pandemic. I want to get a little controversial here. Let's do as, it. As far as, like, the medical industry and you talk about eating right and things like that. You know, there's not that many uh, doctors at the top of the chain that we're getting all our information from that are saying... You know what, everybody? We really got to take care of better care of ourselves if we want to get through this and live through this and be healthy. Oh, yeah. You know, it's like we do. just everybody go lock yourself in your room. Stay out of the stay, sun. Go buy your Funyuns and go home or whatever. You know, get your takeout pizza. Stay out of the sun. You don't want no vitamin. You don't want any vitamin D or sunlight or, you know, uh, don't take your vitamin. They don't talk about taking your vitamins. They don't talk about eating healthy food, raw food, yeah. uh, fresh vegetables. They don't even talk about that. They don't talk about anything that's actually going to help you get, I mean, they they already tell you that the, system. the people that are dying more often are the ones that have the quote unquote, you know, pre preconditions or, yeah. uh, they already have a heart disease or diabetes or asthma like myself. Um, a lot of people are overweight, obese. Most people are. Old, older, older that obviously aren't taking those care of themselves and they're usually full of drugs at that point. That's all they're pretty much, that's their nutrition every day, you know? So it's like, you'd think there'd be actually somebody out there going, you know what, we really need to, to think about our food and our diet and what we put in our bodies to try to stay healthy so we can remain healthy, or at least if we are going to get sick, be more apt to getting through it because we've taken care of ourselves. Yeah. Yeah, that's it. That's my public announcement. It's good to eat <laughs> It's good to get up and exercise and eat healthy. Yeah, you yeah. Know, you all know you're supposed to do that, but nobody does it. No. Yeah, and it's just like uh, brushing your teeth at night, right? And it's like, uh, well, we we all know we're supposed to. Most brush people our teeth have to night, lose a couple teeth. Snacking. Like myself, I've had to, I've had to, I've had to have a few toothaches <laughs> to, to know. Oh well, I got to do this more often. Yeah, man. You yeah. only get that you know, one set. Yeah, you only got one grill, dude. Yeah. That's all. Yeah, it's funny, Unless man. you got good money, you can go out and get a new one. I know some folks that got some of those. Oh, the implants? Yeah, they yeah. were, yeah. Yeah, and that'll get cheaper. Yeah. <laughs> As the years go on, the technology yeah. gets more Your new efficient. robot body will have new teeth. Yeah, exactly. It'll be good. You'll have all kinds of uh, extra features in your teeth yeah. in the future, right? <laughs> Uh, I want werewolf fangs. Werewolf fangs, <laughs> you know, of like course. The werewolf, it's so the bottom ones are bigger than the top. Like the, the vampires, the top ones are the incisors or the sharp ones. The werewolf are from the bottom. Oh, is that how that works? Yeah, I just, you know, whenever you draw monsters, okay. you know, just think like that. It's just important information. That. Yes, it's very important. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm not uh, drawing monsters too often right now. I've just been fucking around with really abstract stuff. But let me see here. I got your Insta open here. My Instagram, my IG. Oh, yeah. I, just like I said earlier in my life, I was fighting off being on being on Look the grid and getting, a, you know, bank accounts and things like that. Then the MySpace came out. I fought with that. Then I finally got a MySpace. Then I finally got a Facebook. Now I have an Instagram. <laughs> I got sucked into the Instagram vortex. I like that guy. He's a rocker. 
Oh, is that one just over there? Oh, yeah, that's the one over there. Yeah, your shit's tight, man. Let's just let me see. I'll find us some. I'll find us a monster, monster. We got one right here. We got that one right there, right? Oh, here's some more Pantera stuff. Let me speak on that too. Like the, the Pantera stuff that you do is awesome. This is shit from my childhood. Does it say Pantera on it? No. But like, uh, I remember growing up, several of us had this T-shirt. Several of us had that T-shirt that's right uh, behind you. Right here, yeah. Yeah, I think this I have is that an actual T-shirt right here. That's an actual T-shirt. Yeah. I, I'll tell you. Okay, I'll tell you that story. You want to talk about the Pantera? I love Pantera. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, just when I first moved here, Vinnie Paul, you know, Vinnie Paul, the drummer for Ban Pantera, uh, he was probably one of the most prominent people you would see on the scene here in Vegas. When oh, I say, big time. When I say on the scene, uh, a patron, he would always just come yeah. and just hang out. He was just the guy watching bands. I don't think I've seen ever seen anybody in town that was out at every single show just there to hang out and watch the bands and support them he was very supportive so obviously when he when he died that was a huge hit to the uh, the community here so but um and i did have a chance to actually at one point talk to him and he saw my artwork and and i got to connect a little bit at least you know and and he and like i said he's been to a few shows that i play and stuff like that and and, and obviously he's really missed around this town but um, but but going back as far as the story of the Pantera, the artwork, and how I got to do it, um, I was living in the Bay Area in Alameda. You know where Alameda's at? Yeah. Uh, right there near Oakland, and uh, I there was a company, uh, a business called Wizard Brewery Company, Wizard Brewing, and they their theme was wizards and dragons and things like that. I had just moved to the Bay. I didn't know anybody. I just saw where's their brewery. I saw their wizard on the side of their logo with a with a beer in his hand, right? And I thought to myself, just thinking, I said to myself, self, <laughs> I need to draw some stuff and send it to them and see what they think. So this is all on a whim, yeah. You know, the way it all led to Pantera. Yeah. So I go and I find out where the brewery company was, which was just a mom pop brewing company, small shop, literally a guy and his wife ran the whole business and they had vats of beer and I started doing sketches for him and he would give me like mini kegs to take home of any beer I wanted and I'd share it with all my friends and we'd party all the time and, and little by little I just started getting to know them and then they eventually hired me to do the artwork for their new t-shirt wizard brewing company right in my wheelhouse as far as art design goes so I was pretty stoked to do that I drew the design for the, the company, for the guy, and uh, he decided he wanted to make T-shirts. So I go, cool, my artwork's going to be on T-shirts. That's awesome. Great. So out of the blue, one day he calls me, he goes, uh, I'm going to get the T-shirts made. They're just going to be simple black and white T-shirts, but the people that are going to be printing them is wi uh, uh, Winterland Productions. Have you ever heard of Winterland Productions? Native. Oh, uh, you need to learn, especially from the Bay Area. You got to know this. Bill Graham, you know who Bill Graham is? The concert promoter? Bill yeah, Graham? Yeah, yeah, I know that. Bill Graham started, he had Winterland Theater and the Fillmore back in the 60s and early 70s. Famous, some of the most famous concerts ever were at his show. He's the guy who discovered the Grateful Dead and all these different bands. Bill Graham, the great concert promoter. I do this because he's great. <laughs> uh, he's the guy who, when he first saw bands like the Grateful Dead and bands of that time with all those people out there, he was the one who said, we need to figure out how to sell these people tickets and we need to fill, figure out how to sell the merchandise. He's the guy. Bill Graham, Winterland Productions. Uh, Bill Graham Presents is a great book. Everybody should read it. It's like a Bible for, for people like you and me. Uh, he's just a great historical person. So anyways, Winterland Productions uh, was built to produce merchandise, okay? So it's this big, giant warehouse in San Leandro, California. Huge, you know, loading docks and all kinds of shit. And uh, so Wizard, my guy from Wizard said, they're going to print our shirts. Do you want to go with me and take a tour of Winterland Productions? And I said, fuck yeah. I had just read Bill Graham Presents. So I knew all about 
this. So I was at M like I always do. I don't have it right now, but I always have my portfolio with me everywhere I go, my art portfolio. It's very simple. It's just a little black book with some artwork in it. So it just in case, because you just never know. Yeah. So the day comes, I go with these these this couple to Winterland Productions to get a tour of the uh, facility. I got to see all the different screen printing machines, and they did everything from Iron Maiden to Slayer to Britney Spears and everything in between. That's that's what they did as far as merchandise and printing goes and T-shirts. All those concert T-shirts you see at all the different concerts, they make them all. They ship them all over the world to everybody. So uh, they had the cool Slayer shirts. They had everything. So anyway, so I go in there, and now we're meeting with the art director who's going to take our project and print shirts. And uh, so this is cool. Now I'm sitting at a table in a meeting room with my little shitty portfolio uh, on a whim because of this whole Wizard Brewery connection. And now I'm sitting at the table like you're sitting right there, and you're the art director for Winterland Productions Art Department. So as we're talking about our project, the uh, guy from Wizard Brewery, he said, this is our guy that drew the image. If you have any questions, ask him and maybe we can work together. I s- kind of slipped my portfolio in on the conversation. <laughs> <clears throat> just like that. I just kind of went, I, I, I always, I always kind of know the, the moment when to kind of, you know, bring something in like that. So, and I brought it with just for that reason. So anyway, so we're having a conversation and I go, well, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. I broke out my portfolio. So now the art director is sitting there with my portfolio in his hands while we're talking and he's thumbing through the portfolio and it's everything I had done up to that moment. And uh, as we're talking, I notice he's at least, he's actually looking at it. He's not just browsing. He just kind of, hmm, hmm, okay, yeah, yeah, mm -hmm, yeah. And then, uh, then out of the blue, he goes, have you ever talked to our heavy metal department? And I go, Wow, there was something called a heavy metal department. Fuck, that sounds awesome. Really? <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, no. Sign me up. Yeah, exactly. Sign me up. Where do I go? What do I do? And he goes, let me give you a phone number and da 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 da. So now he's giving me a phone number, the art director at Winterland Productions, head of all the t shirts and everything. And I'm like, going, wow, I just got a lead. And I, now, again, this is like all on a whim that I started with, and it all just kind of led to something. And then next thing you know, a few days later, I got a whole other interview. Not an interview, but I get, to, I get to go meet the heavy metal department. And I've got to get to go to talk to that guy. And we're sitting there talking, and I'm just walking in the door. I don't know anybody. I never did any of this kind of stuff uh, uh, for a big concert, you know, thing. And uh, he goes, well, you know, we're looking for some new things for Pantera right now. <sighs> yeah, just like that, right. You know, I'm sitting there, like, trying to hold everything in. You know, just like not let, not, you know, acting over excited like I am right now. I goes, <laughs> yeah, 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 sure, Pantera, yeah. Okay, yeah, of course. <laughs> and, and he's like, well, we got this idea. We got a lot of snakes and skulls. Can you make me a cowboy from hell? I go, yeah, sure, that sounds cool. So this was my first design, the, uh, the cowboy from hell. I basically, from that point on, I just said yes. Of course. Oh, yeah, and the deal was that... Uh, I had to actually make an actual painting. This was beyond sketch. We had gone past the thumbnail sketch thing. It's like, no, yeah. no, we want you to make us a cowboy from hell. That's what we want you to do. It took a while for me to soak that in. Like, oh, you want me to actually do it? You know, so I went home. I worked on it. Uh, the deal was that they would pay you so much f- to buy the artwork from you. And if they actually use the artwork, they double of whatever that was. Whatever that number was. I know the number. I'm just not telling you. Yeah. So anyways, so I said, yeah. I went home, literally stayed up all night and all day and did everything I could. The deadline's coming. I got my first opportunity to do some artwork for that might actually be a Pantera t-shirt. And uh, I made the deadline. I was very close, though. And they were putting pressure on me, too. They're like, oh, we really do need it by, you know, Friday, this time, whatever. I'm like, yes, yes, no problem. I, I didn't sleep for a week. Yeah. <clears throat> I busted it out. Yeah. I got it done. Delivered it. Time went by. Done. They gave me my check for doing the artwork. That was it. 
uh, about maybe, I don't know, less than a month later, I get a call or a message telling me that they're actually going to use it for a T-shirt. At that point, the band actually has to approve it, uh, approve the artwork, because it's going to be for their merchandise. So anyway, so to make that long story short, longer, <laughs> uh, basically, uh, they finally did it. They printed it. I actually got to go into the facility where the T-shirts were actually boxed and ready to go out on the road and all that kind of stuff, you know, and into the stores. And I got to snag a shirt, you know, from, from one of the guys that worked on the, uh, the screen printing machines. He gave me a shirt. From that point on, then it led to the second design, which was the, the Panther design. Uh, I noticed at the time, right well, oh yeah, they just said, just, we need another design. And I said, well, what do you want? And they said, just make us something. We don't know. Just come up with some ideas. That's, yeah, that's it right the right there. Panther. At that time, I was very surprised. This is 1999, okay? They didn't have any Panther designs. They didn't, they weren't known for a lot. They had the original earlier ones that were very crude. Yeah. But they, you would think a band called Pantera, which is what they were named after, the car and, and a Panther in Spanish. Yeah. They would be using uh, lots of Panthers, right? But no, it was mostly, you know, fists and f vulgar display of power, you know, Texas references and rattlesnakes and things like that, which, you know, they're w very well known for. So I decided at that point I was thinking uh, that Panther design that you just showed on the screen, what went through my mind was 70s old tattoos and Panthers. You would see like a, like in vending machines and things like that, uh, black light posters, things like that. So I just did it. I just drew a painted a panther on a bed of skulls, and uh, from that point on, it, they bought that one too. So I could tell you probably for me, one of the, my most proudest, proudest moments, similar to when I described you earlier with your T-shirt yeah. and the faded bong T-shirt, uh, there was a show in the Bay Area. This is like 10 years after that. This whole thing's like 20 years ago now. So about 10 years after that, uh, 10 years ago, I remember being at Shoreline Amphitheater uh, at an Ozfest concert, uh, hanging out, eating some killer edibles, and getting all high, watching Ozzy and Judas Priest and all these con all these bands that day. Anyways, I'm up in the grass area, and there was some kid, some you know, dirtbag kid, you know, yeah. rocker kid, uh, with my Pantera shirt all faded, like which meant like he likes that shirt obviously because he wears it all the time. Obviously, you know, it was all faded out. But I swear to God, man, I felt like a. A proud, I don't know, proud, just just proud in general, you know. Yeah. Just like you know, just, that's the kind of thing. Like, uh, you know, when you live, when you live that life, when you're younger, like me, I always love to wear my concert shirts, and and you know, you're proud of what you like, the things that you like, and the art that you like, and the music that you like, and uh, being able to connect with people on that level is just a cool thing. Uh, <laughs> and again, this all came back from these little sketches I did and that just led to something else, you know? Yeah. And we loved him growing up, man. Yeah. Like, you're fucking that, that shirt and this shirt right here, the Panther, like I, I, every, everybody had, I mean, Pan, well, Pantera as a band is, is, I mean, they're up there as one of the greats of all time, as oh, far as absolutely. metal influential, as far as metal bands. And I think the, one of the coolest things that I've always liked about Pantera was, and still is, is that when they did come out, which was uh, late into the early 90s, I guess, is when they were kind of more established. But, you know, there were young kids in the late 80s going into the early 90s. And that's a time where music was starting to... Uh, uh, that's when the more alternative rock was probably more popular. Uh, it was kind of the end of the 80s hair rock kind of era going into this new realm where bands like Iron Maiden and Judas Priest at the time were considered the dinosaurs of the day. And here was Pantera that was pretty much to me in that uh, kind of genre was metal, but it was even heavier and it was even uh, angrier, but it was still melodic. And, you know, there was actual vocals, but yet there was still the heavy growls that went with it. And you had a guitar player in Dimebag Daryl that was a, a unique standout uh, individual, the fact that they were brothers. I mean, there was just had all these different cool elements. It was really uh, just, it, it stood out. There weren't a lot of other metal bands at that time that were metal, you know, that were that, were that heavy. Yeah. You know, so I just love that, man. I still love that about them. They were raw and hardcore. 
Yeah, they were the perfect storm, man. Like there they you go. Really, the once they got Phil and Selmo on vocals, that just did, it was this magic formula that yeah. just <sighs> fucking crushed it, was it. Stadiums and festivals from that point on. Oh yeah, yeah, they've made their mark. Our our, our good friend Donnie De De Chico, or is that how you say his last name? De Chico, I think. De Chico. Yeah. De Chico, De Chico, hey, tomato, hey. tomato, tomato. Uh, works over at Counts Vamped here locally in, in Las Vegas, and he, he's one of the biggest Pantera fans I know out there. You know, I still, I still I see talk to people like yourselves, like I said, that are a little younger than me that actually grew up in that kind of era. And it like means something to them, you know. Oh yeah, I have a Pantera tattoo on my back. See, I like that with Rush. Rush is like my be all end all. I could without without batting an eye. Whenever someone says, "Who's your favorite band?" I could talk about Fishbone. And I could talk about all these great bands I love, Frank Zappa. But I just thought Rush is like Rush. That's it, Rush. That's a good one to pick. Yeah, I, I, I learned how to play along to Rush. Rush is my biggest influence. I try to sound like Rush when I play drums. You know what I mean? I'm not saying I sound like him, but I try, you know? That's what I'm shooting for, you know? And that, that was kind of my, where I grew up and, and, and when music, because Rush was that raw band in the mid 70s, late 70s, you know? We they, should do some Rush songs, man. No, we should play a lot of Rush songs. We should play a lot of Rush songs. Oh, okay, now I'm going I'm on another left turn. This year, this last this this last month in August, Primus had a tour planned, worked out. Yep. They were going to go out as a three piece and play all of Farewell to Kings, the Rush album, all the way through, as well as some other. They're going to do a Rush. Primus was going to do a Rush tribute, and I hope they still will. They will do that Rush tribute. They learned all that. They didn't. Put all the time right. in yeah, to yeah. learning those friggin' songs. Yeah, I did not, not play them, play them right. man. They'll just bring it back yeah. next year. That was like a, it was like two weeks ago or so because I had it marked on my calendar. Oh, you yeah. know, I'm like it was gonna be uh, at the joint or something like that or so, I forgot where. So I was here. going. Oh my god, man! I hadn't bought my tickets yet, but I was going. Yeah, you don't have to ever twist my arm to learn Rush songs or play Rush songs. Me either, dude. <laughs> I love Rush, man. That was one of my favorite concerts I ever got. I only got to see him once, and it was amazing. They uh, are. You just only a saw phenomenal Rush band. one time. I unfortunately got into him a little late in the yeah, game. Yeah, it happens. Like I said, yeah. we're, look, we're 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 at least you know we're a few years apart. It's, yeah, it's always hard to imagine when you're living in the world and you're you're know so many different people how our generations you know we see, we like so much of the same things it's hard to imagine that we're separated by a decade here and there you know yeah. so it's like yeah, you you kind of I kind of forget about that sometimes but like I said for me it's like because I can't go back into the 70s which I think is the greatest decade of all time I love the 70s definitely um, for music yeah oh yeah exactly for for music and just how raw it was back then and how it was just kind of really turning into something uh, but anyways, Rush. Yeah, that's before the technology kind of took over in the it's 80s. Exactly, right? yeah. And it was still kind of this organic vibe. But bands were still bands. Once the, it was, it was kind of weird you say that because 1980, and I talk about this a lot. I remember 1980 very well as I was talking earlier how that's when Pong came out. Like yeah. TV Pong and all of a sudden everyone's got an Atari and they're playing Space Invaders, right? Well, 1980 was very significant because I think musically, that's where it was the big shift. It went real digital. The uh, real digital uh, rock bands, and, and, and now it's a lot easier to love it and accept it for what it was, for what it is. At the time, it was hard. It was like they're taking away everything we love. You know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, but at that time, uh, for example, bands like The Cars, uh, Missing Persons. Uh, punk rock was starting to become popular where it wasn't about trying to learn cool solos anymore. It was just, it was all about emotion and angst and attitude and attitude. And uh, so you could see the times change back then, but back to as far as the technological aspect of it, that's when uh, electronics and synthesizers and keyboards were becoming more prominent than guitars were. There was like a shift, like or a cha or kind of a, an actual moment where all of a sudden you saw guitars go down and keyboards kind of going up, uh, acoustic actual drums kind of going away, and now all of a sudden electric drums were starting to become more popular. It was a little bit more about a new fashion visually, artistically, than it was about the music of the 70s, which was more kind of like hippies on steroids. You know what I mean? It was just oh, yeah. and, and the party. <laughs> you know, it was all about party, 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 you know. All of a sudden, Kiss was 
uh, a band like Kiss that was so bombastic and huge and worldwide was becoming, eh, we've seen it all. We're going to listen to this new stuff. This new, they call it New Wave, you know? Yeah. But yeah, but it was right at 1980. 1980, it all just changed. But I love it now, you know? I had the opportunity, as a matter of fact, uh, you know, that, that was a really cool era, musically, looking back on it, you know, later. And eventually, I did get to play with Missing Persons. I got to play oh, cool. with Del Bozio for about six years. Uh, so, like... Uh, I didn't know that. Yeah, I got to play. I got to, I play, and I still I still communicate and still communicate with the band, and I'll still go do a sub gig once in a while. But for about six years, I was the guy, and I got to tour and ah. travel with Del, Del Bozio and the band. She's this total stoner, so we always got along really good on the road. Of course, you know. And uh, I had the opportunity to share the stage and play on the same stage with like bands like Berlin and Flock of Seagulls and. Uh, what was that? Gosh, was it? There was a few other older bands. I even kind of forgot their name. Those are the big ones. We got to do a concert with uh, Pat Benatar one time and uh, Joe Walsh, and uh, but I liked. I actually got a, a started to like that new wave music. You know, a lot of it's straight and poppy, but when it came to Missing Persons, because their drummer Terry Bozio is such a he's he's a professor. He's he's a wizard. <laughs> you know, Neil Peart's the professor. Uh, Terry Bozio is a wizard. Uh, okay. He's in a whole other. They're, they're, they're similar but very different. But uh, rare, but he, he's another guy, Terry Bozio, who took those electronic drums and he embraced something new, and combined it with all the expert technique that he had developed over the years before that, and kind of put it all together, you know, and helped a newer generation embrace it because it was used well, it was done well, like Bill Bruford, you know, guys like that. They did it so good. Now it's cool. You know, as opposed to just drum machines, we just do, cat, do, cat, you know, they were able to do something with uh, it. <laughs> yeah. Now, those drum machines really changed the game for a lot of people, that's for sure. But I, I, when I first started playing drums seriously and I knew I wanted to be an artist for the rest of my life, or at least as a career, and didn't want to do anything else, that was the exact moment somewhere in the early 80s when all of a sudden, drum machines were becoming more popular and computers were becoming more popular. So in other words, at the time, and I remember specifically, like, you know, when you were a kid in high school, you take a lot of uh, aptitude tests and things like that to find out what you're going to be doing with your life. And, and that was a perfect time. That was a perfect, the perfect storm where they said, well, look, drums are going to be obsolete and artists are going to be obsolete. So you might as well just fucking think about something new, you know, do something different. That never dawned on me to do anything different, but it was <laughs> it was the first. But it was like out of the gate, you know. You want to do this? Well, we don't need that anymore, <laughs> you know. Uh, yeah, that's kind of how it rolls, man. But I um, I love the live drummer. Like that's so important to me when I go see a concert. A good live drummer. A good live drummer. <laughs> that's the thing, right? Is it if, it's, if you got a bad drummer, your band sucks. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it'll ruin the whole show. Yeah. But if you got a good drummer and that guy's back there grooving, yeah. And now he's got the whole audience is grooving to his heartbeat. You know what I There's mean? There's like a power in his vibe. There's a power. I I give lessons to, to to people, drum lessons, and that's something I try to convey or get the I get the idea across that as a drummer. You have a, a responsibility. Yeah. You have an obligation. Time. You know, and most drummers are pretty much put in their corner. You know, you're not a musician. You're a drummer. You know? Bullshit. Right, of course. But but point being that that's kind of a general consensus between musicians, right? They, the ones that know everything. Uh, but the drummer, if the drummer's not kicking the crowd's ass and making them move and feel the music, you're fucked. You got nothing, you know. You need that you, guy or girl, whatever. I mean, I, she Lee is probably one of my favorite drummers too. You know, just so many great drummers out there. But it's that that you feel what the drummer is feeling. So it's your job. I in the back to the lessons. I try to convey to the student that you have that obligation, responsibility, and you have to also be in the moment. You have to be that drummer. You have to go up there and, and want to play good. You have to have to have fun. You have to have fun. You have to really enjoy yourself because if you're enjoying yourself inside and you're playing and you're having a good time and it's sounding good, the rest of the crowd is right there with you, man. If you're up there and you're not playing to that level of excitement and fun and you're just kind of mailing it in, even if you're a really good drummer, 
you're not connecting with the audience the way you really need to be. And you, and, and ultimately you're the conductor, you're mm -hmm. conducting the room. You know, every, uh, one of my favorite posters when I was a kid in our high school was Met Lars Ulrich from Metallica. It was a photo from behind his drum set, looking out into the crowd at the Oakland Coliseum. And it's, you know, filled with people and you're looking at that scene from the drummer's seat, the throne, looking out into the crowd. Of course, he's looking at the camera. It's a famous poster. It's one of my favorite posters of all time. It was on my room. And to me, that was just so inspiring, you know, knowing that you're looking at this whole crowd out there and your foot and your hand hitting that drum and those cymbals. That's like you're like in control of all that. Or you should be anyways. That should be what you aspire to anyways. Yeah, that's where it's at, man. I remember when um, when Anthony stepped up for uh, for Cracker Man to play drums, and he w switched from being the guitar player to the drummer position. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so as a, as a sh the string instrument player, right, or as a singer, which is where Anthony and I are, are used to playing, you your vibe kind of flows with the drummer, and you're always making sure that you're in time with everybody. But when you're the drummer you are the time yeah yeah and so there was this weird thing that was happening where he was like he got really good really fast yeah he did and then um and then so he just started bringing it right away but he was f trying to flow with us still right he right. wasn't like enforcing the beat right 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 and i was like that's the weirdest fucking thing <laughs> you know like <laughs> yeah. we and for both of us it like clicked right there we we're like oh it's like no you gotta drive yeah, it bro you gotta you're drive driving it. this fucking car and we're right we're along for the ride you yeah, know but, absolutely yeah and it was uh it was really a, a big oh moment for us you right know, like, and i was ah. you know I, I have to talk about that man uh anthony Who's a expert, brilliant At guitar everything player? Everything he touches, right? He's, he, he's an expert. Period. He's just a very talented individual, and uh, you know, I know he's also creative, and he does a lot of cartooning and animation. He's very, uh, you know, he's just all over the place. He's having a good time. Yeah. And like you said, he just got behind a drum set, and you would think he's been playing drums most of his life. The way he played. Oh yeah. He played with a lot of energy, conviction. And he let loose. Whenever that O oh moment uh, happened, yeah. I could tell when I saw you guys play perform live that I was, I was just first of all surprised to see him play drums. And then I was even more surprised, pleasantly surprised, that he kicked my ass. You know what I mean? Like, I was going, fuck yeah, he's, he's jamming. <laughs> you know? Everybody thought he was a drummer from <laughs> right. then on, right? They're yeah. like, you play guitar? I right. just thought you're a drummer. You're really good yeah. at drums. I love to see that, man. As you used to drive him nuts. He's like, no, I'm a fucking I'm a guitar player. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a guitar player. Don't call me a drummer. <laughs> That's exactly I it. I know how to play an instrument. Yeah. <laughs> He's, you know, that's his, that's his, that's definitely his jam. He's always my favorite uh, guitarist to play with. Yeah. Hands down. You know, I mean, we learn how to play together, so. Yeah, well, hopefully there'll be some more uh, oh, blue-collar yeah. bastard gigs in the future. I was enjo I was enjoying that uh, original stuff we were doing, too, man. We were getting together and, and spending, like, 90 minutes to two hours yeah, just well, jamming and writing okay, original stuff. Okay, now let's talk for the audience. Yeah. So, yes, we did... Jammed together, jammed, yeah. wrote some original material, or started to anyways, had enough compiled. So now at this point, I think you gave me some of the music, and I tried to download it onto a uh, Dropbox. I'll just... I'll give it to you on something hard. Yeah, I mean, give me a, with. give me something. You know? need, uh, yeah, it's I got it to Dropbox. Dropboxed everybody, every jam. Yeah, I know what happened is the Dropbox got so full with the with the file. See, this is where. Oh, I'm, that's probably. This yeah. is where I start to fall off my technical. I have the Dropbox Pro, so I, like, because I'm always dealing with these big show files as an engineer, right? So they just, they're always sending me shit tons of stuff through Dropbox. So I just I had to get the Pro because like I couldn't even download yeah, a single show. Give file. it to me on a cassette. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, it's probably just too big. Yeah, yeah, it's too yeah. Big. Yeah, well, we'll figure it out. Yeah, because it's because I think that's what really it, it really takes to move forward is just to be able just to listen to it on a casual basis. That's what I usually do. I usually listen to music, uh, whether it's demos or final music or whatever, when I'm painting and drawing, and yeah, which which could be hours at a time. So that's when I soak it in kind of the most, you know, and kind of. It starts to hit me, and I start to listen to it, and I start to hear something more than that's already there, and it starts to kind of come together. So if I could do that more uh, readily, easily, uh, it's a lot easier to do. You know, like I said, I'm still, again, I'm still in the cave. 
I, I, CDs are considered a cave now. And that, to me, that's still the future. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> CDs are like the future to me still. Well, a disc, it's all right here. I got a I got a book full of CDs over there that I never ever ever break out. I you have know? boxes of records. Oh, dude, vinyl. The vinyl's a different thing, though, man. The vinyl's yeah, it's a, a different thing. The, it's it's but it sounds different. It right? does sound and, different, yeah. And you have to be aware. But I got like, a CD player for the vinyl. <laughs> right? It's gonna it's gonna it's the the, the A side's only gonna go for twenty five minutes or whatever, and then you're gonna flip it. Yeah, yeah. And no. so you got to be there in the room. I love vinyl and like pay attention i love vinyl i love the fact that there's enough people out there right now that are actually into the whole uh collectability of it you know it's kind of a niche kind of cool thing right now but it does sound it does have a unique warm sound to it that you can't that you lose when you listen to digital formatted music oh big time like uh I noticed right away we did um, when we got a, a digital desk over at Vamp for, uh, and we had that big analog desk at the same time. Mm-hmm. We did the Nyquist theorem uh, test, which is uh, the the desk runs at forty eight thousand samples, and uh, I might be getting a little over people's heads. And then that you're going over my head right now. It's just straight voltage, <laughs> the right? Decibels in the desk or something. Uh, so um, basically, what it means is if you're running at forty eight k, and Nyquist theorem says you can only actually capture up to like 24,000 hertz uh-huh. and the human hearing kind of cuts off at 20,000 but as at our age it's probably more like 16k but um great but there's I'm still, I'm losing my k's yeah there's still harmonics that are happening right, right. Uh, up to 24,000 hertz but when you anything past that it's gone and so what we did we did a a b test with one of my friend's bands over at the club and we mixed the shit out of them on the digital desk then we mix the shit out of them on the analog desk then we go turn up and i'm running in front of house with both desks right right turn one ABM, and all of a sudden, when you every time you go analog out of the digital realm, all this brightness and sibilance and symbol splay and all right. this stuff is happening. Yeah, that it's just very clear. Like when the band's playing, and you switch over, you go. It's yeah, like you don't have to be a, a, a technical expert. You have to be a technical expert to figure that all out to be able to decipher the two things. But when you just add the average listener, if you just give me something to listen to, you could tell the difference. You know, you can just oh, yeah. go, oh, yeah, that sounds more full or this sounds more bigger. Like you said, more things are happening. I'm not losing as much. All of a sudden, you hit the other button. It's like, where's where's this? Where's that? You know? Yeah. I, I, yeah. I can't hear this, you know? But if you never had it in the first place and you just bring that digital desk in, right. no one's going to tell. Right, yeah, yeah. And you're going to be like, fucking sounds great in here. Because it does sound great. It still sounds great. Right. But, it, but there is a difference yes. between pure voltage and a digital conversion. I've had the opportunity to actually record on tape, you know, like a two inch tape in a studio in the past and noticed the differences when I started working in more digital uh, situations. I could tell the difference. I could tell, I I could tell it was just a little, a lot warmer, a lot bigger. It it sounded like it had more air within it. It was, it is air. You're capturing the air. There you go. Then I know what I heard. (laughs) Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's with magnetism, right? On a, on a, on a piece of tape, you actually, you can zoom in on that. You can see the waveform on the individual tracks there's individual little strips just like if you if you pulled up a pro tool session you saw the waveforms right if you if you take like an eyepiece and you know you zoom in on that uh in reality on the tape it's uh it's a bunch of waveforms on there and but you're actually capturing uh, real air movement you know real pure sound and now we're boring uh, everybody yeah probably <laughs> probably <laughs> no, um yeah, it's it's pretty cool though. I I really I really dig that shit. Obviously, again, obviously that's why I said earlier, and I'm, I'm jokingly as far as the boring part because, yeah. like I said, some people just have a certain oh, yeah. mind or aptitude to just kind of see all that, even before they touch it. They just they know there's something there they have to get through. To, oh, I had to get it. Yeah, <laughs> I had to get my hands on it. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> when you go digital, though, like to finish the the whole thought, um, it, what you're doing is you're taking a bunch of pictures of that waveform. Right. Just like how your camera, say, uh, takes uh, megapixels, right? And the more megapixels, the clearer the image is. Right. Uh, so it's uh, the the sample rate that you're using is your megapixels, right? And so that's how many pictures you're taking. So when it says like like a, a CD, a Redbook CD is 44.1 uh, thousand samples. 
at 16 bit depth. So you got like a grid that's 44,100 by 16 that's put over the top of your waveform, right? And whatever it lands in that grid, it can translate into sound for you digitally. Ladies and gentlemen, this man has degrees on his wall <laughs> to prove that he knows what he's talking about right now. I know, I've seen these degrees. Um, but yeah, that's why it sounds so, that's why you lose a lot. That's why when you when you do MP3s right, you're 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 making that image smaller again, and compressing that down, and uh, and yeah, so that's why digital. So how do we open so it up, man? How do we let all impressed. that sound out? How do we come into a world where we get to use all that as opposed to lose it? Uh, listen to shit on vinyl like we were talking about. <laughs> Go buy a record player at your yeah. local pawn shop. I don't. I mean, I put a record on every every once in a while, a couple times a week. We'll put a record on in the morning, but most of the time, I just use the Alexas, and uh, and she plays back MP3s off of Amazon.com or oh, Spotify yeah. for me. You right? got the Alexas. You got that computer. I can't do that, man. Oh yeah. See, you're giving it to the Cylons, man. I'm telling you, it's an inevitability, my friend. Yeah. There's no, there's no, uh, I, there's no way out. Just let it happen. Embrace it. Just let it happen. Use it. I'm nobody. It. Who am I? A, a Russian spy or something? Nobody gives a <laughs> shit about me. Nobody's tapping my, you know. They're nobody's. not. No, I mean, they're, 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 there are recording stuff, like, for sure. They can go back and pull up what's happening in the Sure, rooms. of course. Um, there was that one, I, I don't know if, I, I haven't done research on it, right, but I heard about that one case where the guy murdered somebody and, and they were able to pull up the audio recordings from the Alexa devices wow. and, and use them in court. But you got to get a warrant, you got to pay for that kind of stuff. It's not like the cops are fucking monitoring everybody, right? It's like, it's just it's just raw data and a thing. But even then, people don't don't like that aspect of it either. All right. Well, raw data, like, raw data could still be altered as well. Yeah, anything can. I mean, at this point, it's a it's a mess. What about those uh, deep fakes, right? Like the deep fakes are insane. The what? The what? Who? Deep the, fake. It's a deep fake. It's where they change your face to someone else's face. Oh, I hate voice. those things. Yeah, man. Uh, there's a, a a good friend of mine. His name's Polly Walnuts here in the local band. Oh Smashing yeah, Alice. Yeah, we all know. We all know who him. He knows who he is. You know who you are. And uh, it's funny. Don't give me your art. I laugh. They're the funniest fucking things ever. And they they put your face on. I hate. I, yeah. It freaks me out when I see my friends putting their face on like Madonna or something like that. That I kind of get weirded out. But uh, you know, when, when it's a dude friend of mine doing his thing, but it, but it makes me laugh and it's really funny. Um, but the fact that they could take your face and put it on uh, anything. Yeah. Anything. Uh, I, I I remember when I first saw the, uh, I think I noticed it the most when I first saw the uh, the new Star Wars movie, Rogue One, which is one of my favorite of the Star Wars uh, series. And they showed Peter Cushing, he was in the original Star Wars, they recreated his face and put it on an actor and brought him into a prequel. <laughs> you know, he's long dead, right? Yeah. He died like in 1980 or something like that, but... Uh, but anyways, uh, it just tripped me out how they could take someone's face. And uh, they're doing it a lot now, too, like a lot of the Marvel movies. Uh, they're going back in time and talking about people when they're younger, showing them when they're older, and then they have images of when they're younger. They're in the movie. They're acting. They're moving around. Oh, yeah. It's as if they're really there, and it's this totally younger version of them. I was just watching Ant-Man and, and the Wasp. It, that's, that was one of them. It was uh, Michael Douglas. Michael Douglas looks so young in it that It looked flashback. like him. Yeah. yeah same thing and with it looks the, just like him. Kurt like, Russell. Is, is that how they're doing Kurt it? Kurt Russell in the Guardians Galaxy, uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 2. Oh, yeah. See, I thought that was makeup. But well, I'm sure it's probably a combination, is it? Yeah. perhaps, but... A deep fake would be such a good way to oh do that. Oh, my God. It's gnarly. Oh, uh, they did it with Princess Leia at the end of Rogue One. Yeah. Um, oh, is that how they got that on there? It's all deep fake. That's what I'm saying. That's smart, yeah. They, it's they like, figured yeah. it out, man. Yeah. So... You know, I thought about this when the pandemic first started, <laughs> the, the, when the whole thing, when the lockdown started, everyone said we were on quarantine. No, we, no, we were locked down. Yeah. There, that was, there was a big difference. But anyways, bottom line is that uh, I thought to myself, self, you know, I was thinking, you know, we already got all the great music. We already got all the everything we need. You know, the Rolling Stones have made their songs. We got, we got, we got the Beatles collection. We got everything. We got Pantera. What else do we need? You know, <laughs> in other words, I don't see right now, and this is actually my gauntlet being thrown down, my challenge. I'm taking it upon myself to even uh, meet this challenge. Um, there, we live in a time right now where we're spending so much time, and I say we as far as society generally, 
We spend a lot of time staying at home. We're bitching and moaning because we've, we're stuck and we can't do nothing. We're, we're doing all the, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of creativity on the internet, but there's no real revolution as far as art and music is concerned. For example, like the 60s and the 70s, where uh, songwriters, you know, whether it was Neil Young or Crosby, Stills and Nash or Jimi Hendrix or whoever, call, call out any, any great songwriter from the, those eras, Bob Dylan. They were all writing about the moment and singing about the moment and creating from the moment, their, how they felt about it, how it was affecting them, how, how can we get better, how can, how can we come together. I don't see a lot of that right now at all. I've, I don't see a, a real – prove me wrong, kids. This is what a Principal Skinner said once on a Simpsons episode yeah. when he says, these kids have no future. Prove me wrong, kids. I would love for to see it happen. I would love to see a revolution. I would love to see people dig deep. And, you know, instead of just writing a post on Facebook or, or the Internet or whatever and, and doing their little blogs or whatever and pissing each other off and blocking each other and getting mad and offended by their politics or whatever, create something based on what you're feeling right now to, for other people to hear and see and share that amongst each other. And get your message out there in other ways, you know. And who knows? Maybe that music can help start a revolution. Maybe it will be impactful. But I haven't seen it so far. Uh, I always say we haven't seen a real "We Are the World" moment right now. More people are in <laughs> hiding. They're not going out there saying, "Yeah, come on, let's get together and pay for the poor people and take care of people that are sick and things like that." Oh, it's, that breaks my heart. People are just hiding. You know, the people with money and power prior to all this. Or more just kind of sticking in their corner, you know, staying at home and keeping on the down low, thinking about themselves. I, I'd like to see with this, uh, with the internet and with this new technology that we have, all the stuff we're talking about, I would like to see more people out there expressing themselves in other ways, you know, try to, try to be the revolution. Don't wait for it to happen. You know, yeah, we're seeing a lot of peaceful protesters and riots and looting, I think a lot of that is very politically influenced and, and not really, really about making change, but just kind of destroying things and, you know, expressing your angst. I get all that. Yeah. But I That's would what like, happens when they lose control of 330 million yeah, great yeah. apes. It, it all just goes right? crazy. Right? Like it is, this species of, of, of Homo erectus is this unruly rapscallion of a fucking being. And, and, they and keep, you have this many of them under control. And they and also like, fuel the fires of that, yeah. too. They want that to happen. So, that again, I'm throwing down the gauntlet. Where's my gauntlet? <laughs> uh, I, I'm throwing out the challenge to anybody out there who's actually took the time to sit here and listen to any of what we're talking about right now. Um, that's what I would like to see more out of the artists. You know, I, I, now, I won't completely paint everybody with the broad brush. I am seeing... Some individuals out there like myself and yourself that are doing, again, you're doing this show. It's yeah. a productive, uh, creative outlet. You are talking about things that matter or that are significant. But as far as musical, musically, uh, I don't see a lot out there. I'd like to hear more of it. I put my music on the back burner pretty hard just because well, there there's you no go. shows. It's a perfect right? example. There's yeah. no shows. But there's something inside you. You know, there's something inside people that they want to say or they yeah. want to express. You know, let's let's start. I see a lot of, uh, you know, like now the big thing with musicians around the world. And I got it's like a double edged sword. It cuts both ways. I hate it and I love it. I don't I see all the, the Zoom rooms, you know, where you got, say, the drummer for Anthrax playing with the guitar player for Dream Theater, playing with the singer for blah, blah, blah. You know, you got people from all over the world doing these things. Yeah, I like those. I like them, but I hate them. I hate them because it's taking away the human element out of something that I have such a connection to. And I would, and, and I think as far as not, not so much people like our age or older have done it for a while, but the ones who've never done it before, you know, the, the, the kids right now coming up, absolutely, they're losing that human element of having to be in the room and say, fuck you, you suck. You know, those are actually growing pains that, that, that help you move along. But really, and again, I, but I also like, I think it's cool. I think it's cool when you could see a band play together from around the world. Again, I like it and I hate it. So, but you know, I, I see more, I see a lot of people playing other people's material, cover tunes, uh -huh. cover versions of other songs. Uh, there's some original arrangements. I would just like to see more original 
arrangements, more music coming out of people and saying something and playing something that's new and different that's not been done before. That's what I want to see. And that's my gauntlet, and it's on the table right now, so run with it. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, I think that's actually a perfect place to uh, to end the podcast. Did we already right? talk two hours? That was two hours. I told you it happened so fast, Dang. right? It's just fun, and we're having a good time. You're just so goddamn engaging. Yeah, thank you, man. I, I'm enjoying the conversation with you. You know, you're saying, you're talking about some fun stuff, man. I really had a blast today. Well, thanks for having so me. That's right? awesome. Well, let's uh, let me sign off, and uh, we'll pull some some tracks off my computer and hand them to you on a hard copy. Nice. So you can take yeah. Them home, we can, then we'll we'll make some music. Yeah, and then we'll make some music, yeah, right? Sounds- Good to be I'm here. really looking forward to that project because right the stuff we were jamming was really cool and yeah. I was digging it. It's only going to get better if we just put a little time to it. And that's it, man. Well, thanks again for uh, being on my podcast, Mike. I really appreciate it. And uh, this has been To the Fullest with Jason Froberg. Uh, we're going to fade to black. B L A C K. Hey, everyone. Thanks for watching my podcast. You can check out more podcasts right here and subscribe by clicking right here. We are a new podcast every Monday morning at 6 a.m. Pacific Standard Time.